What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to what if Zoro was reborn in JJK as Toji's son. Part 6. Like, share, and comment on the video. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't subscribed. Remember to check out the original story, link in the description. Join my membership to support the channel. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Sparring. With who? Jito asked warily. Zoro answered casually. One of you, or dad, a one-on-many fight was a bit bothersome. It didn't exactly fit his current goal of testing his power. Father, you mean to spar with that gorilla surprised? Jito exclaimed without his usual respectful address for a teacher. No, you'll get hurt, Zoro. I won't, Zoro stated calmly. Though still physically young, his armament haki was different. As long as he didn't delay encoding his entire body with it, he was confident he could withstand most attacks without taking damage. Even if it was from Toji, Jito, or Satoru. I'm not sure about that purple technique. Unlike Toji and Jito, Satoru's attacks had a very high destructive power. Especially that purple technique, Zoro wasn't sure if his armament haki could fully defend against it. But that didn't mean he intended to avoid sparring with Satoru. Gorjo remained silent, unusually quiet compared to his typically playful demeanor. Instead of Gorjo, who was quietly observing Zoro with an inscrutable look, Jito tried to reason with Zoro. Look, Zoro, sparring isn't real fighting, but it's rough. It can be very tough, and you can get hurt. I know, it's not my first time. Not your first teacher. Jito glared at Toji with burning eyes. Even if we, as active sorcerers, do it, I don't think it's right to train your son in the same manner. That's child abuse. Toji, met with Jito's sharp gaze, looked back at him askance. He was incredulous and frustrated, but most of all, he found it ridiculous. You know nothing. He thought if Toji and Zoro sparred, who would end up getting beaten wasn't clear to someone making such comments. In most spars between Zoro and Toji, Toji was the one who ended up taking hits. Of course, there hadn't been a time when Toji went all out with the intention of truly hurting Zoro, but the same could be said for Zoro. Ignoring Jito, Toji looked down at Zoro. Are you going to use it? Though the question was vague, Zoro understood it was about Haki and responded. Yeah. Just spar with me. You said no. It's better than with one of those guys. Revealing his haki was one thing, but the thought of how those two would react was already giving him a headache. However, Zoro shook his head. I think it's better to do it with one of those two this time, not dad. What Zoro wanted to understand was the relationship between haki and Jiyoku, curse energy. Thus, it would be better if his opponent also used Jiyoku. Though Toji used curse tools, there's a clear difference between the Jiyoku of a sorcerer and the Jiyoku in curse tools. Noticing Zoro's intention to spar with someone one who uses Jiyoku, Toji's expression hardened a bit. Should I spar with you after that? Forget it. Why bother? It's frustrating, but inevitable. Zen and Toji couldn't handle Jiyoku. In exchange, he acquired superhuman physical abilities. So, there was nothing he could teach his son about Jiyoku. Bitter taste. Sorry. No need to apologize. Zoro, checking the condition of his sword, said, I'll let it go this time. But next time I spar with you, it'll be for real. That's not what I meant. Toji sighed. He had wanted to keep the existence of Haki a secret as long as possible. But it seemed impossible now. There was a hint of regret. Maybe I should have told that Gorjo guy earlier. Then perhaps they wouldn't have fought. Opposing the spar now. Toji knew he couldn't win against Zoro. Being the father, he knew his eldest son's temperament well. Once Zoro decided something, he hardly ever went back on it even if the family opposed. You're too reckless. And you. I've always fought only battles I knew I'd win. Even during his days as a sorcerer killer, he never took on jobs that seemed too troublesome or paid too little for the effort. But as with many parents and children, Zoro was quite different from Toji. Seeing those lively grey eyes for the first time in a while, Toji crouched down to meet Zoro's gaze. Don't reveal everything. Yeah. He couldn't even if he wanted to. He wasn't skilled in three sword style or capable of using Conqueror's Haki yet. Don't get hurt. Answer me. Promise you'll be around. Healthy Marimo after the spa. Don't end up flattened. I'm not a Marimo, okay? All right, Zoro. Zoro just shook his head. He couldn't promise not to get hurt. That wasn't something Zoro could decide on his own will. Zoro glanced at Gorjo. Though he seemed expressionless and silent, his observation Haki read the turmoil inside him. Under his rationality and self-control, he was on the verge of erupting. Vivid excitement and fighting spirit. Gorjo seemed a better choice than Suguru, Satoru. With determination, Zoro called out to Gorjo, who was casually sitting with his legs loosely folded. Gorjo met Zoro's gaze and chuckled. Ha, oh, really wanna spar with me? Why? Because it seems like Dad and Suguru don't really want to. There's no need to force someone who doesn't want to fight into combat. Zoro likes battles, not slaughter, oppression, or torment. Right now, the person with the most fighting spirit here was Gorjo. You think I'd want to spar with a brat like you? Yeah. 
don't know what makes you so sure, but Gorjo couldn't deny it. Because he's a child, a subject of protection, the son of a gorilla. For several reasons, he had been avoiding confrontation with someone who now was asking for a spy himself. If he didn't accept now, who knew how many years he'd have to wait before seeing that kid's strength. Gorjo glanced at Toji. His expression screamed headache. But he didn't seem like he would interfere or stop them. He then stood up briskly and exclaimed cheerfully. All right, let's spa with me. Satoru, spa, Suguru. You think I can't control my strength? Gorjo, unable to hide his excitement, exaggeratedly swung his arms around to loosen up. Get ready, Marimo. I'll avenge the grudge I have against the gorilla. Why are you taking out your grudge on my son for something you faced? Hey, the one who asked for the spa is your son, Professor. Cross. The line, and I'll kill you with everything I've got. Yeah, yeah. Jito yelled incredulously at Toji. Professor, you're really not going to stop them. Can't stop them. Zoro doesn't listen to people, and he especially dislikes being interrupted in a fight. So, once Zoro has made up his mind to fight, there's virtually no way for Toji to stop him. Maybe if he grabbed Zoro and ran away right now. If it were a life or death battle, Toji might have carried Zoro off regardless of being despised. But this was a spa. Sparring with Gorjo would be highly beneficial for Zoro. More importantly, win or lose, Zoro wouldn't just be overpowered. Oak. Oh. Toji spit out the weapon storage spirit. Then, from the swollen mouth of the spirit, he pulled out a katana-shaped curse tool. It wasn't a curse tool with a technique or a high grade. Just a simple katana with only pure cursed energy infused, a grade 2 cursed tool. It could have been a special grade if it had as much cursed energy as split soul katana, but it wasn't, so it remained a grade 2 tool. Zoro handed over the ordinary katana he usually carried. Toji took it and gave Zoro the katana cursed tool. Be careful. Yeah. Try to land a hit if you can. Zoro nodded. Jito placed his hand on Gorjo's shoulder and seriously said, Satoru, you can't hurt him. He's just a child only six years old. Don't think of it as fighting. Think of it as playing with him. Be gentle with everything. I got it. Don't do it. Or your already precarious humanity will cross an irretrievable river. Ah, Toji took out his phone and called Shoko. No matter how the match went, she would be needed. SSHH. Zoro drew the two swords he had tied to his waist. He held the Wado Ichimonji in his left hand and the curse tool in his right. Zoro raised the curse tool in front of his face to inspect it closely. As expected, it feels different from a normal sword. Blue and dark energy enveloped the entire sword. Even without observation Haki, any swordsman would notice. This sword was not ordinary. Swish. Zoro swung the sword through the air. Watching this, Gorgeous made a sound, you use two swords. Technically three. But he wasn't going to use that technique now. Unless his life was in danger, he promised Toji he wouldn't use three sword style. Gorjo made a puzzled face. How do you use the third sword? I hold it in my mouth. Is this a circus? How do you balance with such a method? It should be impossible for a human to have the jaw strength to swing a sword, and even if possible, the sword held in the mouth would interfere with the trajectory of the other two swords. You fight in a funny way. Zoro didn't mind Gorjo's comment. It was a reaction he often saw from those who face him in his previous life. Of course, their reaction changed after experiencing the three sword style firsthand. Zoro just smiled lightly. Too bad I can't show you now. It would have definitely been more fun if he could. Hum. Gorjo tilted his head in curiosity. He was interested in the three sword style, but it seemed unlikely he would see it today. With a smug gesture, he pointed at himself with his thumb. I'm a nice student who knows fair play, unlike Mr. Gorilla Teacher. So, I'll specially leave the Mukajin off for this match. No, leave it on. Ha! Huh. I'm not planning on holding back. Gorjo's technique Mukajin was really annoying to deal with as an enemy but it was perfectly suited for a sparring partner. Because the opponent could clash with him without holding back, without worry. Gorjo, taking off his sunglasses and showing a rare expression of confusion, asked, Are you sure that's okay? Yeah, but click. Swoosh. A few strands of white hair were cut and fell to the ground. Gorjo closed his mouth, looking at the falling strands of his hair in front of him. His vision moved slowly. In front of Gorjo's nose, Zoro was pointing his sword at Gorjo's forehead, although it was blocked by the just activated mucogen. Just now, Zoro wasn't as fast as Toji or Gorjo, but he was as fast as a typical grade 1 sorcerer, who strengthens his body with his main strength. How? There was no application of main strength. Nor did his body turn black like when Toji defends against the blue attack. Purely physical ability. Not a non-sorcerer with a strength of zero. Nor without any jujutsu or main strength. At the age of six. Is that even possible? But the one who had done it was right in front of him. Thump, Gorjo's heart raced. A tension similar to the first time he faced Zoro flowed more vividly through Gorjo than ever before. This child in front of me, no, this person, he is strong. It looks like you're ready. Zoro, feeling Gorjo's aura sharpen, drew his sword. For Zoro, it had been a long time since he had an opponent he could go all out against, no. It was actually the first time since his reincarnation. Toji had the skill, but regardless, 
There was a cautiousness due to the parent-child relationship, and Toji disliked it when Zoro overexerted himself during sparring. Zoro untied the black cloth bound around his forearm and wrapped it around his head. A black shadow cast over his eyes, and Zoro's expression turned distinctly sharp. Let's start. He was excited. Zoro didn't hide his anticipation and grinned broadly. They're really fighting. Shoko, who rushed out from the infirmary at Toji's call, grimaced at the sight of the two facing off. Zoro might enjoy brawling because he's young. But why is Gorjo doing this? She thought they were both crazy. She shook her head in disapproval. Yeri sat next to Toji, who was standing with his arms crossed. Toji kept his eyes on the sparring match and said, You're here. As if I could be anywhere else. She had seen something last time. Yeri tapped her knee with her fingers, looking anxious. They won't both get hurt like last time, right? With Gorjo's reversal technique, he should be fine. And your son, sir? I don't know. It depended on how fiercely they fought. Toji would intervene immediately if they crossed the line. But until then, he could only watch. This was a sparring match, after all. Jito, who was about to step in and stop them, was halted by Toji grabbing his shoulder. Jito slapped Toji's hand away. If you won't step in, I will. No matter how you looked at it, this was madness. A sparring match between Satoru and Zoro. Jito, visibly upset, confronted Toji. What kind of behavior is this for a father? Instead of protecting your child, you're putting him in danger. Surprisingly, the person who bristled at Jito's words was not Toji. But Shoko? She was fixing her disheveled hair from rushing out and frowned upon hearing Jito's accusation. He knows nothing at all. Yeri looked at Jito with a disdainful gaze and spoke ominously. Hey Jito, when you were knocked out, do you know who did it? Obviously, it was the teacher. It was him. Yeri nodded towards Zoro. What are you talking about him? Zoro. Shoko remembered clearly. During the time Toji, Gorjo, and Jito were fighting fiercely, the small child who casually blocked the shockwaves directed at Yeri. After Jito was knocked out, it was Zoro who joyfully chased down and subdued the rampaging Shikigami in the forest. Zoro isn't just someone Toji-sensei needs to protect all the time. You're the same. If such a child is sparring, it must mean Zoro himself has judged it beneficial for his growth. Probably, Toji-sensei has judged it the same way. It's not a parent's job to obstruct the path their child chooses to grow. Nor is it anyone else's place to meddle. And it's not like Toji would just leave Zoro to get hurt. He called her even before the fight had started. Yeri stated coldly. Don't act like you know everything. That's arrogance. Yeri lit a cigarette and said, That kid is much stronger than you think. And probably stronger than even Gorjo thinks. Chito had a hard time accepting this. With a face that screamed in comprehension, he said, Zoro is a non-sorcerer, Shoko. And he's only six years old. How could such a child be strong enough to handle my Shikigami and Satoru? Chito asked as if challenging the notion. Well, we'll see about that now, won't we? Shoko murmured as she lit her cigarette. Gorjo looked at Zoro standing opposite him, smiling, with a sense of wonder. It was the first time he had seen someone so openly excited about a fight. As if he didn't care at all what others thought of him. Well, that was a thought for later. The fight was what mattered now. Maybe start with a light physical technique and concentrate on manipulating my energy. Whoosh. Gorjo charged at Zoro, enhancing his body with his energy. His fist wrapped in blue energy, aimed at Zoro's stomach. Clang. His thrust punch was blocked by Zoro's two swords. Even though it wasn't Gorjo's full power, he had put quite a bit of strength into it. And yet it didn't budge. Normally, an average curse would have been shattered by Gorjo's energy. And the reason was quite clear. Gorjo's eyes, darkened, captured Zoro's hands and the two swords. Well, one of them was originally a black blade. As expected, you're using that power. This was an opportunity to see the limits of that power. To do so, he would have to push Zoro quite hard. Decided, Gorjo clenched his fist and launched it forward. Whoosh. Gorjo threw his fist towards Zoro's chin as if to take it off. When Zoro swiftly dodged the attack, Gorjo's fist targeted the solar plexus, shoulder, neck, and various other parts of the body. Boom. Bang. Bam. Energy exploded in the air. Despite the several threatening punches from Gorjo, Zoro handled them with ease. Sometimes he dodged by moving his body, and at other times, he crossed his swords to defend. Even though Gorjo was faster, not a single hit landed. Gorjo narrowed his eyes for a moment, then eventually realized why. He knows my movements when and where to move and dodge, what attack to make next, and what stance to take. As if looking at a cheat sheet during an exam, Zoro knew every one of Gorjo's moves. Is it just intuition? Or is it some kind of ability that turns his body black? It was invisible to the naked eye, so it was impossible to tell. Clang. Zoro crossed his swords and pushed forward, strongly deflecting Gorjo's punch. Two sword style, Cyclone. Zoro spun around, swinging his swords, and the spread energy from the circular motion flew towards Gorjo. The attack that reached the limitless caused no damage whatsoever. Two sword style, 
style, Dragon Twister. Zoro aimed an upward slash at Gorjo. However, the tip of Zoro's sword never actually touched Gorjo's body, stopping at a certain distance. Even when he slashed downward again, the result was the same. Indeed, Zoro had somewhat grasped the principle of the limitless. The limitless isn't just a simple barrier. The closer an object or attack got, the more its speed slowed down until it eventually stopped. Tricky. Zoro tilted his head. Whoosh. Gorjo leaped forward, rushing towards Zoro. He didn't care about any attacks Zoro might launch. After all, he was enveloped in the limitless. As Gorjo's fist flew towards his face, Zoro extended the blade of his sword in a flowing draw. Like water flowing along the blade, the trajectory of the fist was altered. What? Following that movement, Zoro naturally dove in and swung his weapon towards Gorjo's stomach. The attack was blocked by the Limitless, and didn't cause any damage. Zoro, frowning, quickly jumped back before Gorjo could counterattack. Was that just now a unique ability of that sword? Or was it that black power? It's swordsmanship. I redirected the path of your fist. It's usually used by swordsmen to deflect bullets or cannonballs but there's no reason it couldn't work on a fist. Complex techniques or abilities were impossible, though he probably thinks any technique he sees that isn't sorcery must be some kind of spirit. Of course, that wasn't the case. In Zoro's previous life, there were plenty of people with unique abilities and techniques that had nothing to do with devil fruits or haki. Swordsmanship. Gorjo chuckled incredulously. Could pure swordsmanship really deflect a punch filled with energy so effortlessly? It might be hard to finish this with just physical techniques and energy manipulation. Huh? Maybe it's time to play a bit dirty. Gorjo leaped back to create some distance. Then, he recited a simple spell. Jujutsu Purification. Blue. A whirlwind of blue gravitational pull surged towards Zoro, as if to engulf him entirely. Watching the scene, Zoro sheathed his swords. Swoosh. After crossing the handles of his two swords in his hands, Zoro lowered his stance. A. Hey. Self in a barren world. Prepare to be cut. His grey eyes flashed with a red murderous intent. Two sword star draw. Shying. The two swords were drawn out lightning fast, and the blue energy was split in two. Dragon Twister. Boom boom boom. The split energy passed by Zoro, flying off in different directions. One went into the forest, and the other into an empty clearing. The split blue caused chaos around, pulling everything nearby into a mess. Trees, rocks, and dirt were all overturned, dust flew everywhere, and birds scattered in panic. Seeing the forest and clearing, half destroyed by the blue, and Zoro, unscathed by comparison, Gorjo couldn't help but let his smile stretch almost to the point of tearing. Zoro, you, are you really that strong? His blue eyes gleamed pleasantly. Hearing Gorjo call him really strong, Zoro was somewhat taken aback. You're just realizing that now. After all the excitement and talk about strength when Gorjo first visited Zoro's house. Well, I've never really shown my full strength in front of this guy. Maybe it's because his sight is too good. Gorjo seemed unaware of things that aren't visible to the eye. Well, he is strong but still lacks experience. It made sense. There are things you can only understand through direct experience. For instance, the relationship between energy and Haki was something even Zoro only grasped after swinging his weapon. Zoro, looking at his weapon imbued with both energy and Haki, thought, now I understand. Energy and Haki. These two energies do not interfere with each other. Like water and oil, energy and Haki coexist within the same weapon but do not mix, they stay separate. This was both an advantage and a disadvantage. It's good that they don't cancel each other out or clash, but being able to use one doesn't mean you can use the other. However, that doesn't mean there's no way to manipulate energy with just Haki. A possibility had already come to mind for Zoro. I should give it a try. Resolved, Zoro sheathed his way to Chimonji and held only his weapon. ESSSS. Black armament Haki thickly wrapped around his weapon. The black aura whirled around the blade's edge. Whoosh. The energy of the weapon suddenly increased as if fuel had been poured on fire, and Gorjo's eyes widened. While he couldn't see Haki, he could clearly see the movement of the energy. No, it's not that the amount of energy in the weapon itself has increased. Zoro hadn't infused his own energy into the weapon. He concentrated it. The energy that was spread throughout the weapon was now concentrated entirely on the blade. This was similar to pouring oil to forcibly move water. Using the characteristic that the two energies do not mix, Zoro densely filled the weapon with a large amount of Haki, causing the separate energy to be pushed out and concentrated in a specific location by the Haki. Of course, it wasn't as easy as it sounds. If the movement of the energy was misdirected, or if the intensity of the Haki was low, the energy would leak out between the weak Haki and flow to the wrong place, reducing its power. High intensity armament Haki, delicate control of armament Haki, a high understanding and proficiency with the sword. All these were necessary for it to be possible. These. 
With things Zoro had already mastered long ago, he gripped the weapon in his right hand and tilted it towards his left shoulder. Then, he supported it by grabbing his right wrist with his left hand. Zoro slowly opened his mouth. Eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind. The six roots of a person with affinity for good, evil, and the neutral mind. And each with purity and impurity. Dash in a human lifetime, the 36 afflictions. One sword style, 36 pound phoenix. A deep blue slash imbued with both energy and haki. Swelled like a phoenix, flying towards where Gorjo stood. Gorjo's eyes widened as the crescent shaped slash crossed the clearing, passing by him. Creak, crunch. The slash didn't cut through the limitless, but the trees behind Gorjo in the forest were sliced through. The trees that the slash pass had jagged, white lines appear on them, and then they were cut in half, falling one by one. Thump, 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 thump. Gorjo turned to look at the forest. The rough traces of energy left on the trees were as clear to his eyes as if they were etched there. Just now, Zoro had launched a slash filled with energy from where he stood. Gorjo chuckled, then asked seriously, what did you do? I launched a slash. Even though you can't manipulate energy, using slashes and techniques wasn't rare. There were sorcerers who could launch slashes at a distance. Even Ryom and Sukuna, known as the King of Curses, was said to possess techniques that launch slashes, according to records. However, launching a slash without a technique, and that too without manipulating the body, was unprecedented. Zoro wasn't too smug about it. After all, launching slashes wasn't that uncommon in the Grand Line. Rather, he was focused on organizing the facts he had just learned. Energy can be infused into slashes and launched at targets at a distance, just like Haki. And whether it's a characteristic of this weapon or all weapons, he wasn't sure. But once energy is infused into a slash and launched at a distance, the inherent energy in the weapon is consumed. The energy does slowly replenish but at a terribly slow pace. Using an attack infused with energy again in this fight would be difficult. Ugh. Suddenly, Zoro's vision spun. Nearly falling over, he managed to stab his sword into the ground to steady himself. Droplets of sweat fell from his face. Huff, huff Zoro, breathing heavily, clutched his trembling right arm and gritted his teeth. Damn, my body is still too weak. While his proficiency with Haki remained from his past life, his strength and stamina were significantly lacking. Therefore, the slash caused too much unnecessary destruction, and it wasn't sufficiently imbued with energy and Haki. Just fighting to this extent made his arm hurt and left him breathless. A short-term fight might be manageable. A prolonged battle was still beyond him. To increase his chances of winning, he needed to end it quickly. There was no time to catch his breath. As soon as Zoro pulled his sword from the ground, Gorjo extended his hand as if he had been waiting. Technique reversal, red, boom. A flash of red light followed by a tremendous explosion. A repulsive force that pushed everything away now even sent the stump left from Zoro's slash flying. Whoosh. Following the swing of Zoro's sword, the thick dust cleared. Gorjo made a thoughtful noise upon seeing Zoro's clothes tattered from the dirt and explosion. You didn't dodge. I can't dodge at your speed right now. That's why he defended with armament Haki. The activation of the Haki was slightly delayed, causing a scrape on his forehead. But that was a minor issue. Gorjo placed a hand on his side. If you can't dodge, you defend. Simple. Yet many sorcerers and spirits died because they couldn't manage the simplicity against Gorjo's techniques. I did control the power a bit. But it wasn't thrown lightly. About 70% of the usual intensity of red. Facing that level of red head on and only getting a scraped forehead. Honestly, Gorjo was astonished. Did that gorilla really need to protect this guy? He seemed like someone who didn't need protection at all. Was it because he's directionally challenged? That made a bit more sense. Anyway, if he could withstand that level of red, maybe I can go a bit stronger swoosh, shying. Another slash flew towards the limitless. Shoosh. As Gorjo used blue to absorb the slash blocked by the limitless, Zoro clicked his tongue. I hate just being on the receiving end. It was annoying to be in a situation where Gorjo hits and Zoro can't land a single blow. Though it wasn't the first time, it was frustrating. After all that chatter when you were launching the slash earlier, now you're silent. Is it an omission of the incantation? A disclosure of information? It's up to me. Hum. Oh, right. It's not even sorcery to begin with. Gorjo inadvertently thought of Zoro like a sorcerer and recognized his mistake. The technique names Zoro shouts are fundamentally different from the incantations chants a sorcerer recites to activate a spell. Unlike incantations, the names of the techniques aren't essential for Zoro's technique activation. In other words, not saying them had no effect on the power of the techniques. Given that all the strong opponents Gorjo had faced except for Toji were sorcerers, it was unavoidable that he unconsciously treated Zoro as he would a sorcerer. Nanami and Jito at least had the experience of facing the gorilla. A typical sorcerer would undoubtedly struggle to face Zoro. A strong opponent who doesn't use sorcery at all would be an unpredictable variable for them. Zoro tightened his trembling right arm. The Phoenix of the 36 Afflictions is now out of the question. Not just muscle strength, but his stamina was also running low. I can properly launch only one more strike. Zoro grinned. That should be more than enough. 
Gorjo hadn't attempted to block Zoro's attack since activating the Limitless. Clearly, he thought there was no chance of getting hurt as long as he had the Limitless. Zoro wanted to cut through that belief. Whoosh! Blazing armament Haki engulfed the Wado Ichimonji. The sword, like flickering black flames, absorbed the Haki, emitting an even darker light endlessly. Pop pop pop! The flame-like Haki continuously absorbed by the sword enveloped it, making it look as though it was wrapped in black cherry blossoms. Gorjo narrowed his eyes. Although he couldn't see the principles as clearly as with sorcery, he couldn't fail to notice such an overt display of intent. The dark energy was visibly encircling Zoro and his sword. The upcoming attack would be different from the previous ones. Ash then, I should respond earnestly. Gorjo lifted his fingers, forming a hand seal. Then, he recited an incantation similar yet different from Jujutsu Purification Blue. Phase. Parameter. A pillar of light. It was when Toji was about to draw his inverted spear of heaven and intervene. His eyes met Zoro's. Beneath the black hood the grey eyes warned Toji of just one thing. Don't interfere. A vivid red sphere of energy appeared in front of Gorjo's hand. Technique reversal, red. The moment the energy sphere shone, the whole world was dyed red. Then, boom. An extremely enhanced repulsive force began to destroy everything around the small piece of land Gorjo was standing on. The already ruined sports field was further excavated, and the forest, which had some shape left was completely uprooted. Ugh. Like the other things, Zoro was lifted high and thrown far away. Landing barely on one of the flying trees, Zoro, despite feeling as if his entire body would shatter into dust and disappear, tightly grasped his sword. One sword style, flying dragon flame. Zoro leaped towards Gorjo. With his sword emanating haki like falling cherry blossoms, he sliced through the red and swung at Gorjo. Slish. A black line was drawn in the red world. The red was cut. Because the red energy of red covered the world, slicing through red felt like slicing through the world itself. An unreal silence enveloped the space where everything had been blown away. As if the red destruction just moments before was a lie, everything was simply calm. Gorjo slowly moved his eyes. Zoro was lying a few steps away in a crater, bleeding profusely. Ha! Huh. Ha! Huh. Ha! Huh. Breathing heavily, Zoro managed to sit up. Unable to stand, he sat and smirked. The Limitless is a good ability. You! Ha! Huh, use it well. But, of course. Zoro spoke as blood dripped from his mouth. It's not invincible. He knew from trying several times just moments ago. Ordinary armament Haki couldn't penetrate the Limitless. But what about armament Haki that could strike an enemy without making contact? Armament Haki that infiltrates and destroys from the inside without damaging the exterior. Flowing Sakura. If that flowing Sakura was applied to the sword, could it deliver a hit beyond the Limitless directly to the body? The answer was now evident before his eyes. Even if the sword doesn't directly touch the body, and without destroying the Limitless itself, the attack connects, drip. Gorjo touched his forehead with his hand feeling a sting. His forehead was slightly cut, and his fingertips came away with red, slippery blood. Whoosh. The cut area ignited. Gorjo unconsciously rubbed his fingers to extinguish the flame on the wound. Although the flame was much smaller than one produced by a cheap lighter, it left a mark on Satoru Gorjo. A permanent mark that not even a reverse curse technique could erase. There was a wound. On Satoru Gorjo, even while wrapped in the limitless. With an expressionless face, Gorjo rubbed the slippery blood on his fingers. The distinctive sting of a burn was clear on his forehead. He lowered his hand. His eyes flickered with immense disbelief and a strange euphoria. You, how did you do it? No, that's not important. Whether it was using the power to turn his body black, somehow creating fire from the sword, or whatever his identity might be. None of that mattered to Gorjo anymore. What remained was a deep sense of satisfaction, fulfillment, and an endless fighting spirit. I want to fight. To know just how strong he is, for sure. To clash with all my might, and again. To finish it. That's enough. Toji, holding his inverted Spear of Heaven, blocked between Gorjo and Zoro. He completely shielded Zoro from Gorjo's view, as if protecting him. This is no longer a sparring match. That line had already been crossed. Oak. Zoro made a strange noise, fumbling with his mouth, then spat something out onto the ground. Three baby teeth. Whether the faces of Shoko and Toji went pale or not, Zoro nonchalantly wiped the blood mixed with saliva from his mouth onto his sleeve. It felt weird somehow. Was it the after-effects of that red attack that had shaken his baby teeth loose? Gorjo raised his hand towards Toji, then slowly lowered it. He wanted to send Toji flying and continue fighting with Zoro. They both still had energy left, hadn't shown all the cards, wanted to fight more, and yet but Satori Gorjo and Zen and Zoro were not enemies and what had just happened was supposed to be a sparring match. Zoro was already badly injured, and to continue would make it not a sparring match, as the gorilla said. It would be a battle to the death. Gorjo pouted his lips, annoying. 
Why is he still six years old and on my side? If he were about my age and an enemy, we could be fighting to the death without any hesitation right now. However, Gorjo was aware that his thoughts were quite strange, so he didn't voice them out loud. He took a step back, then another, slowly distancing himself from Zoro. Gorjo took out his sunglasses from his pocket and put them on. Wearing fragile sunglasses was a signal that he had no intention of fighting further. Toji sighed in relief. He had been inwardly worried about Gorjo's eyes, but fortunately, Gorjo decided to stop on his own. Yeri hurried over to Zoro. His entire body had been battered and torn by the strong repulsive force, bleeding from everywhere. Though they were just baby teeth, he had lost three of them. This was not an injury that could be treated here. They needed to go to the infirmary. Shoko assessed the situation at a glance and called Toji. Sensei, right. Toji quickly picked up Yeri and Zoro in a princess carry and ran towards the infirmary. Do I have to keep this on? Zoro, sitting on the infirmary bed with a sullen face, lifted his wrist connected to a blood pack. Next to Zoro's bed, Toji sat cross-legged in the chair meant for guardians. Beside him, Megumi and Sumiki were hugging each other, sleeping soundly. Toji responded to Zoro's question as if it was the most obvious thing, of course. While Shoko could heal wounds with her reverse technique, it couldn't regenerate the blood already lost. Perhaps her skills with the reverse technique might improve to make it possible in the future. But for now, it was beyond her capabilities. Thus, even after applying the reverse technique to patients, blood transfusions were essential. Zoro moved his arm connected to the transfusion tube back and forth, his face turning grumpier. It's uncomfortable to move. Then you shouldn't have bled so much. And to top it off, losing three teeth. Toji refrained from scolding his injured son, instead ruffling his green hair vigorously. Shoko recorded on the chart. Administering Abtype blood to Zoro had depleted their stock of reserved Abtype blood. We'll need to request more. Just in case something like this happens again, better to have plenty. Zoro had lost a lot of blood and had many wounds but his internal organs, bones, joints, and ligaments were mostly unharmed. Thus, by disinfecting the external injuries and applying the reverse technique, they could complete most of the treatment. Whether he defended himself or it was because Gorjo controlled his power during the sparring, I'm not sure. Yeri thought it was the former. Considering the latter, Gorjo's eyes at the end of the sparring clearly showed he still wanted to fight, always acting younger than his age, wanting to fight with a kid 10 years younger. Shoko shook her head in disapproval. Meanwhile, Gorjo was kneeling in front of Yaga in the corner of the infirmary, his fists clenched and held up awkwardly. Hold your hands properly, Satoru. Sensei, can we stop this? I think I've been punished enough. What nonsense are you spouting after launching a high-level spirit technique at a kid who hasn't even started elementary school? Cough, cough. An infuriated Yaga put Gorjo in a rear naked choke. Gorjo, struggling for air, tapped on Yaga's thick arm, signaling surrender. Watching this scene, Zoro attempted to sneak off the bed, but Toji stopped him. What are you doing? I was going to raise my hands too. Why bother? We fought together. It's unfair if only Satori gets scolded. Yaga turned to look at Zoro. Being one of the more reasonable among sorcerers, he couldn't possibly ask a six-year-old, who had just been bleeding profusely, and was still receiving a blood transfusion, to kneel and raise his hands like Gorjo. Next time, don't join him, Zoro. It wasn't me who joined, it was Satoru. It was Zoro who had requested the spa. Quickly escaping Yaga's choke, Gorjo said, See, I wasn't the only one causing trouble, we fought together. Are you six years old like him? Yaga was so frustrated he almost fell backward, clutching his neck. Toji looked at him with a pitiful gaze. I'm not one to feel pity for others. Seeing Zoro's condition when carrying him earlier almost made Toji faint. Toji didn't want to see Zoro, who had stained his clothes with blood and gasped for air, like that ever again. Not ever. You're grounded for a while. Why? If I let you out, you'll end up fighting with him again while I'm not looking. Just like now, bleeding profusely. The thought alone made Toji dizzy. Zoro just shrugged. That's what sparring is. Zoro was used to fierce spars that didn't aim to kill but could result in an eye being gouged out. Compared to his sparring sessions with Mihik, his spar with Gorjo was less intense. It hurts, doesn't it? Not really. It was bearable. Don't just bear it, dodge. Toji recalled how Zoro hadn't made a sound even when dousing his wounds with stingy antiseptic. It was admirable, but more than that, it was heart-wrenching and frustrating. Aren't normal kids this age supposed to cry just from falling? He wished Zoro wouldn't just endure, that he wouldn't accept pain just to become stronger. In the face of hard fights, it would be okay to run away and cry about the pain. Isn't that what kids his age are supposed to do? Toji hadn't cried much at that age either. He takes after his mother and everything else. He wondered why only that trait resembled him. It was good that he had left Megumi and Sumiki with Yaga during the spa. It was also fortunate that they were asleep when he went to pick them up after the spa had ended. Regardless of the fact it was a spa, both would have been severely shocked had they seen Zoro bleeding profusely and spitting out teeth or receiving a blood transfusion. Shoko approached Gorjo. Hey, trash. You didn't get hurt, did you? Normally, Gorjo would retort with a ha as if anything could hurt me. But this time he silently slid his hand across his forehead. A very small scar, 
just below the white hair at the top of his forehead was visible. Its position was such that just lowering his hair a bit easily concealed it, and it was faint enough not to be noticeable unless seen from very close. Still, a scar is a scar. Yeri, being a reverse curse user, immediately recognized the nature of a scar. The wound itself healed with the reverse curse technique, but it left a scar because it was a burn. Yeah, there are generally two reasons why a scar remains even after treatment with the reverse curse technique. The attack was too strong to completely erase its traces even with the reverse technique, or it was a burn. Given the minor size of Gorjo's scar, similar to a paper cut, it was clearly the latter. Yeri nonchalantly flicked Gorjo's scar with her finger. I can't remove this. I know. Well, I could cut out the scarred flesh entirely and then apply the reverse curse technique. Eek. I don't want to go that far. Then it'll never disappear. It doesn't matter. When Gorjo felt the small flame burning on that wound, he didn't get angry. He was actually pleased. It was like proof that there were opponents in the world who could face him with all their strength. That Satoru Gorjo wouldn't have to be alone due to his overwhelming strength. For life, seeing the faint smile on Gorjo's face, Shoko decided not to worry about the scar. If he didn't mind, there was no reason to force the issue. Why bother? By the way, what's up with Suguru? Shito was leaning against the wall of the infirmary, staring blankly into space. The scene of Zoro and Gorjo clashing replayed in his head endlessly, as if the loop button on a video was pressed. Survival of the weak. To Jito, that was the ideal of all societies. Non-sorcerers are the weak. Sorcerers are the strong. For a proper society, the strong, the sorcerers, must protect the weak, the non-sorcerers. If sorcerers do not have the right mindset and oppress non-sorcerers, the weak will be mercilessly trampled by the strong. But recently, Jito Suguru had witnessed examples that directly contradicted his belief right before his eyes. First with Toji, and now with Zoro. Are those two exceptions? Even if he tried to think so, it didn't sit right with him. Even if most non-sorcerers are powerless. If there are rare ones like these two who can even injure Gorjo, can non-sorcerers truly be called weak? If non-sorcerers aren't the weak ones, then what about sorcerers? No, what about me? What's the purpose of fighting curses? Yeri glanced at Jito, lost in thought, then waved her hand dismissively. Let him be. It must be hard to accept. After all, they've been saying like a mantra every day that as sorcerers, who are strong, they must protect the non-sorcerers, who are weak. But then they saw a six-year-old non-sorcerer giving the strongest sorcerer wounds. It wouldn't be strange if his brain just stopped working. That's what Shoko thought. Gorjo approached Jito, who was frozen like a statue. Hey Suguru. Suguru, are you sleeping standing up? Hey, you know the limited edition pudding you bought earlier. I ate it. Hum, still no reaction. After waving his hand in front of Jito's eyes a few times, Gorjo then started pressing on Jito's nose as if ringing a doorbell. Ding dong, ding dong. Ding 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 ding. Is Suguru there? Are you there? Non-sorcerers are weak so we must protect them blah 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 tilde working hard on your position talk tilde embarrassed Suguru because the kid he thought was weak turned out too strong erk. Chito, smiling slyly, delivered a clean uppercut to Gorjo's stomach. Can you be quiet, Satoru? I'm trying to think here. And when did you eat my pudding? Huh? So you were listening. Both of you, stop it. Yaga intervened trying to break up Gorjo and Jito's fight, which only doubled the commotion. Toji discreetly covered one ear each of the sleeping Tsumiki and Megumi. It didn't seem like it would quiet down anytime soon. Megumi Zenin had been curious about something lately. What would his brother give him for his birthday present? He had a guess about Tsumiki's present. In the past few days, he had seen Tsumiki sneaking into her room alone and making something out of colored paper. After figuring out it was his birthday present, he pestered Tsumiki to show it to him. But she firmly refused to reveal the gift before his birthday. Give it. No, I'll give it to you on your birthday. Ultimately, Megumi didn't get to see Tsumiki's present before his birthday. He puffed his cheeks and huffed in faux anger, but Tsumiki just smiled back. That was okay. After all, Tsumiki would give him the prepared present on his birthday. Megumi was more curious about Zoro's present than Tsumiki's. Zoro wasn't always a kind guardian to Megumi. Sometimes he was brusque, and sometimes he scolded him strictly. Especially when he said something mean to Tsumiki. Ignored his warnings not to run on the stairs, or tried to pull out Zoro's sword. Yet, Megumi never thought Zoro would forget to prepare a birthday present for him. I love you. He said that every day and hugged him tightly. Still young and inexperienced, Megumi didn't fully understand what Zoro Zoro meant by love, but he liked the warm embrace when he said those words, so he would wrap his small arms around Zoro's back, say, I love you back, and hug him, just like a child imitating what they've seen and experienced. Then Zoro would pull him even closer into his embrace, enveloping him in his warm, humid heat. Megumi was certain such a brother wouldn't forget his birthday present. Papa will give me a present too. This wasn't just a guess. A few days ago, 
He caught Toji coming in with a huge dog plushie he had never seen before. It was clearly not for Zoro or Tsumiki. Toji rolled his eyes for a moment, then stealthily covered Megumi's eyes with his hand. Let's pretend you didn't see that. How could he pretend not to see what he already had? Though he didn't understand, Megumi nodded with his eyes closed. When he opened them again, both the plushie and Toji had disappeared. In the end, before his birthday, Megumi knew about two of the gifts and remained clueless only about Zoro's. Finally, on the morning of December 22, 2005, Megumi's third birthday arrived. He woke up full of anticipation and excitement. Upon opening his eyes, he saw his loving sister Tsumiki sleeping beside him. Megumi reached out his hand towards Tsumiki but stopped, thinking he might wake her. Whoosh, whoosh. Hearing the sound of something heavy being swung, Megumi got up. In the corner of the room, Zoro was drenched in sweat, swinging a heavy weight. Grey eyes met small green ones. Zoro, who usually doesn't interrupt his workout for anything, hesitated for a moment before putting down the weight and approaching Megumi. Did you wake up? Yeah. Happy birthday. Zoro spread his arms wide as if to hug him. But Megumi cringed and stepped back. Why? You smell like sweat. Hey. Toji emerged from behind Zoro, slinking in. To take the day off today, Toji had been swamped with heavy duties over the past few days. Thanks to that, he had no missions or classes today. Toji grabbed the collar of Zoro's shirt and hoisted him up. Your brother's right. Go take a shower. I can walk there by myself, you know. The way you say that makes me not trust you. It seemed entirely possible for Zoro to get lost even inside the house. What? What do you take me for? A person with a poor sense of direction. Toji kindly carried Zoro to the bathroom, set him inside, and closed the door neatly in front of a dumbfounded Zoro. Witnessing Megumi, with sparkling eyes, attempting to reach for the weight Zoro had been using, Toji realized the potential danger. He could get hurt doing that. Quickly stepping between Megumi and the weight, Toji scooped him up. Megumi pouted with a sulky expression, giving Toji a sense of deja vu. It was like seeing a younger, grumpier version of himself in the mirror. Zoro doesn't resemble me at all. But Megumi is like my clone. One child who doesn't resemble either parent except in personality, and another who, aside from personality and hair, is a spitting image of Toji. Faced with such extreme genetic distribution, Toji pondered deeply about the genetic formula. Where did their mother's genes go? All into the kids' personalities and Megumi's hair. Well, that's fine. It's better than them having my personality. Megumi tightly grabbed Toji's hair. Too Jai, it's Toji. Toji, right. Perhaps because Zoro occasionally calls him Toji, Megumi sometimes refers to him as Toji instead of Papa. Although it wasn't a polite form of address, Toji didn't really mind. It was fine however his son chose to call him, especially since Megumi was polite and bowed respectfully to others, saying, Hello courteously. Megumi pointed his finger at the weight. I wanna lift that. Absolutely not. Can I when I'm bigger? Maybe. Since Megumi is a sorcerer, he might be able to lift it once he grows up, and can enhance his physical strength with cursed energy. Megumi jumped around excitedly. Will I be strong? Stronger than brother. That seemed unlikely. Toji thought to himself. Even if Megumi grows up to manifest his technique and becomes a sorcerer, it seemed improbable that he could become as strong as Zoro. After all, Zoro is Zoro. Unless he manifests some extraordinary technique. But even then, it would be difficult. Zoro had left a scar on the face of the man touted to become the strongest since birth, who indeed reached that pinnacle. But he seemed pleased. Toji frowned, recalling Gorjo grinning with his forehead exposed, showing off the scar left by his son. Toji, who had been there at the time, knew all about it. But what was he supposed to do? Pay for the treatment. Regardless, without manifesting a particularly powerful technique, Megumi stood no chance. Come to think of it, the manifestation of his technique should be in a year or up to three years from now. A sorcerer's technique manifests between the ages of four and six. Toji remembered this because he too was somewhat protected by the Zenin family from the age of four to six, just in case. Of course, after that period passed and the last hope vanished, the bullying intensified as a backlash. Click. Zoro, having showered and changed clothes, opened the bathroom door. Then, Megumi pushed Toji's face away with his hands, although Toji didn't budge at all. Is that what you call pushing, Megumi? Was that just a touch? You need to get stronger. That's what sea urchins do, poking sharply. Megumi punched Toji's sturdy arm and shouted, Let me go. I don't want to. Wah. As soon as Toji set him down, Megumi dashed and nestled into Zoro's embrace. Whether he knew his spiky hair was poking Zoro's cheek or not, he rubbed his face against it, burrowing further in. Toji's mean. Oh, smart one, Megumi. Toji chuckled at Megumi's clearly different attitude when hugging him compared to Zoro. His likes and dislikes are very clear, my little sea urchin. Zoro, who had been hugging him, released his arms and gently patted Megumi's back. Let's wake Tsumiki up and have breakfast. Presents. Cake. After breakfast. Ugh, but it's your favorite pork ginger fry. Ginger. Excited, Megumi sat down on a chair. Zoro went to wake Tsumiki, and Toji headed to the kitchen to heat up the food they had bought in advance. It was a moment of rare peace. Tsumiki had folded ten colorful paper rabbits. 
Toji had bought a huge black dog plushie. And, Sumiki. Mine is a pink ball. Mine is blue. Toji watched as Megumi and Sumiki played inside a large ball pit. The paper rabbits Sumiki had folded as a gift along with the large dog plushie Toji had given were buried among the balls with the two children. The balls scattered outside the pit as they moved rolling towards Toji's feet. Whatever the reason for their amusement, the two kids pressed and squished the balls through them at each other and moved around in the pit laughing continuously. Zoro's birthday gift was none other than a ball pit large enough to fill the living room. While it wasn't as huge as those found in kids' cafes, it was sufficiently large for the two to play in. Toji observed them playing joyfully in the ball pit. Catching his expression, Zoro asked, Don't you like it? It's not about what I like. It was Megumi's birthday gift, after all. It was just bewildering. That had been the case from the moment Zoro started pulling out the enormous box and the large plastic bags filled with balls from the storeroom. The moment they began inflating the pit with a pump, the two kids' eyes lit up. As soon as the balls were poured into the pit, they jumped in and showed no signs of wanting to leave. The plushie is one thing, but Sumiki's paper rabbits will get crumpled under all those balls. Neither seem to mind such details. Let's get to the point. Why did you choose this as a gift? Megumi mentioned wanting to have a snowball fight. That was after he had been looking at a picture book about snowmen. But in Tokyo, it was rare to have enough snow for a proper snowball fight. Taking a trip to a snowy region seemed too cold for Megumi and Tsumiki, and there was a risk of the kids getting hurt in a snowball fight. They were still very young. After all, Zoro wanted to give them something similar to a snowball fight. Toji nodded, understanding Zoro's intention. Then take them to a kid's cafe. Megumi doesn't play comfortably in such places. Whether it was because he was still not used to crowded places, the incident with a high-level curse appearing in a department store, or simply because there's always a curse or two in crowded places, was unclear. Someday, Megumi would have to face and overcome his fear of that incident and curses. But it didn't have to be today. It's his birthday. Just having them laugh and enjoy the day was enough. On a birthday, comma, dealing with curses and chasing down an absentee father was Zoro's domain. Even after the department store incident, Sumiki and Toji became noticeably tense in places crowded with non-sorcerers. Ironically, the only person who remained calm was Zoro, who had been the most severely affected that day. There was no need to choose a place where the entire family would feel tense and anxious for Megumi's birthday. Today is Megumi's day, a day when blessings and grace came to them. Toji fell silent for a moment, remembering Chia smiling broadly while holding the newborn Megumi. He recalled the night spent flipping through a kanji dictionary, pondering what to name the soon-to-be-born Megumi. The name they eventually chose was common yet meaningful. He had never regretted it. After all, the child was born blessed and became their grace. When did you buy it 10 days ago? Right. When we went shopping together. Right. I asked for it to be delivered home. That was when Toji and Zoro had gone shopping together. Toji saw Zoro stopping by the toy section, but thought he hadn't bought anything since he left empty-handed. Actually, it wasn't bought as a birthday gift. Zoro had hastily claimed it as a birthday gift when Sumiki pulled out the paper rabbit for Megumi's birthday. Anyway, he had intended to give it to Megumi. So it wasn't entirely a lie. Probably. The price. 10,000 yen. Did. You buy it with the taxi fare I gave you. Toji had given Zoro several tens of thousands of yen in cash, instructing him to always carry it with his cell phone. So he could take a taxi if he ever got lost. Zoro shook his head. Satori gave it to me before he went on his trip. That guy. 10,000 yen. No, a total of 100,000 yen. It was the money Satori gave Zoro for his sixth birthday before going on a trip to the sea, telling him not to come back for about a month. Zoro asked if it wasn't too much, but Satoru had already ignored his question and went off to bother Jito. Zoro himself didn't understand why Satoru trusted him with so much money. Was it because Satoru had a lot of money? Was it given as part of a birthday gift? I didn't really have anything to spend it on, so I just kept it with the taxi fare in my wallet. During the trip Toji had paid for all the lodging and food, and Zoro rarely wanted anything for himself except for exercise equipment like weights or dumbbells. And even most of that was bought by Toji, who only restricted the purchase of anything too heavy. That's when he decided to buy the gift for Megumi's birthday. Thankfully, they seemed to be enjoying themselves. Yeah. Whoosh, whoosh. Like diving under, the two children popped their heads out from beneath the balls. Brother, throw the balls. Er, Mao, Megumi wants you to scatter the balls. Zoro walked into the ball pit filled with balls and swung his arms. Infinite Dragon Twister. Whoosh. The balls rose in a whirlwind and then showered down. Megumi and Sumiki jumped around trying to catch the falling balls. Whoa. A ball fell right on top of Toji's head. Despite the living room being scattered with colorful balls, some of Tsumiki's folded paper rabbits getting crumpled, and the black dog plushy Toji had gifted now lying forlornly on the floor. After being ejected from the ball pit, Megumi and Tsumiki truly looked happy. That's all that matters. Of course, cleaning up afterward would be a task. Toji caught a ball that was about to roll away towards the kitchen. After lunch and again after dinner, Megumi and Sumiki continued to play in the ball pit. 
They never seem to tire of throwing balls, squishing them, trying to build towers with them, naming them, and engaging in role play. It was only right before bedtime, yawning and slowly emerging from the ball pit, that their play ended. After the playtime, Zoro and Toji deflated the ball pit for storage, and collected the scattered balls back into plastic bags. As it goes, ball pits are for children to enjoy to their heart's content while guardians deal with the aftermath. This way? No, not this. Discovering some of the ten paper rabbits Tsumiki had gifted were crumpled, Megumi tried to reshape them back to their original form. Proudly placing the roughly reshaped rabbits on top of a storage cabinet, Megumi looked back at Tsumiki. However, having exhausted all her energy from the day's excitement, Tsumiki had already fallen asleep on the sofa, breathing softly. Zoro returned from putting the ball pit away in the storeroom. Toji, seeing the storeroom packed with various items, thought it was time for a cleanup. Megumi reported to Zoro as if tattling. Sumiki's asleep. She worked hard folding them. She must be tired. I'm not. Sure you're not. Your eyes are starting to close. No, they're not. Megumi's face turned red as he yawned at the end of his sentence. Zoro chuckled, then picked up Megumi and held him. As he gently stroked his back at a steady pace, Megumi whined softly. I'm not sleepy. Why? If I fall asleep, it's not my birthday anymore. Megumi thought the reason today had been so fun was simply because it was his birthday. So, he wrapped his arms around Zoro's neck and whined. Can't we have my birthday tomorrow too? It would be nice if tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, and the day after that could all be birthdays. Megumi muttered sleepily. Then, um, tomorrow we can eat cheesecake and the day after tomorrow, chocolate cake yawn and the day after that, go to sleep. Holding Megumi with one arm, Zoro pulled out a blanket from the closet with the other, and laid it down. After arranging the bedding, Zoro first laid down Megumi then gently placed Tsumiki, who was asleep on the sofa, next to him. Megumi clutched at Zoro's shirt. Don't go. I won't. Zoro covered Megumi and Tsumiki each with a thick blanket. Then, he took his own blanket and lay down next to Megumi. He seemed so much bigger than when he was a tiny, wrinkled newborn, but moments like this reminded Zoro that he was still just a baby. Well, he had just turned three, so of course. Tap tap. Zoro rhythmically patted Megumi's back. Under the soothing touch, Megumi's green eyes, so much like Toji's, slowly blinked. Just as he seemed about to fall asleep, Megumi snuggled closer into Zoro's embrace and spoke up. She's not here. Hum. Why didn't Mama come? It's my birthday. Zoro's hand, which had been gently patting Megumi's back, paused for a moment. Mama? Yeah. Everyone has a mama. In books, on TV, at the playground, or the supermarket. Everyone had a mama by their side. Except for Megumi's family. Megumi yawned deeply. I asked Papa yawn, but he didn't say anything. When Megumi asked Toji that question, he froze like ice. Megumi touched Toji's nose and cheeks, tried to melt the ice with a ding sound, but Toji remained silent. For a very long time, Toji, after detaching Megumi from his embrace, ultimately left without saying a word. Megumi called out, Papa, but he didn't turn back. He called out, and though he must have been heard, he was left unanswered. It was the first time Megumi could remember something like this happening. Papa's face, I've never seen it like that before. To Megumi, Toji usually had his face scrunched up in an unflattering way. But sometimes it softened when looking at him, Zoro, or, on rare occasions, Tsumiki. Yet, even to Megumi, who was used to Toji's indifferent and wrinkled expression, that face was different. The trembling eyelids, the green arises blurring like water droplets spilled on a drawing, the mouth that opened slightly, as if to say something then quickly shut, and the gesture that distanced Megumi from Toji. It was as if he seemed like he was crying. It resembled the face Megumi saw reflected in a shop window, when Zoro had once let go of his hand and walked away, leaving him alone. His mind had gone blank, and all he could do was cry. Of course, Zoro quickly returned to Megumi's side upon hearing his cries. But Toji, on the other hand, pushed Megumi away. Adults can cry without tears. That was something new Megumi learned. Why did Papa cry? At Megumi's question, Zoro was momentarily at a loss for words. He didn't know how or what to say. Zoro didn't fully understand what cheer meant to Toji, and the kind of love there was. Even though they were a family, the relationship between Toji and Chia and between Zoro and Chia was different. But one thing Zoro was sure of, the sorrow Toji felt after her death was probably much deeper than Zoro could imagine. Yet, Zoro had to explain. Because Toji wouldn't. Because he loved. Whom? Your mama. Megumi's half-closed eyes suddenly opened wide again. Lying down, he kicked his legs, causing the blanket to flutter. Do I have a mama too? You did. Chia, the best mama. Zoro thought silently. Why didn't she come today? It's my birthday. Zoro looked at the grumbling Megumi with a distant gaze, and pulled the blanket up. Because she's dead. 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 Passed away. Megumi mulled over the word and tilted his head. Then he asked, so, when will she come? Zoro remained silent. Today? 
The child had just turned three. It was natural not to understand what death meant or what happened to those who died. I should tell him. Zoro didn't know how to sugarcoat the death of a parent. Even if it were possible, this wasn't a topic to be glossed over with a plausible lie. Megumi was Che's child too. Though young, he had the right to know about Che's death even if the details didn't need to be fully explained yet. So, Zoro replied succinctly, she can't come. Why? Those who have died can't return. There were rare exceptions, like Brook or Zoro himself, who had returned from death. But well, Brooke had eaten a devil's fruit in his lifetime, and even Zoro couldn't return to his original world. Even the cursed share left behind had now forever departed from Zoro. She cannot return. Megumi spread his fingers wide apart. Even if I sleep this much. Even if you sleep ten nights ten times more. Megumi couldn't yet calculate exactly how much time that would be, but he understood it was a very long time. Never see her. That's right. The little hand slowly fell. The pink lips pressed tightly shut. Megumi might not have understood death well. But Zoro did. When Zoro said something couldn't be done so definitively, it meant it was impossible. Whether Megumi threw a tantrum, cried, screamed, rolled on the floor, or calmly explained his wishes. Nothing ever changed. Nothing at all. Tears welled up in the green eyes. Curled up in Zoro's embrace, Megumi clenched his fist tightly. Why everyone else has one? The bears in storybooks. The kids on TV. The children they meet on the streets. They all have a mama who holds their hand, smiles, and stays by their side. Why do I? Why am I the only one? Megumi sobbed softly. Zoro pulled him closer into his embrace. I want to see her. You've already seen her, Megumi. I don't remember. What her face looked like. How she hugged him. What her voice sounded like. What she said. I don't know. I don't know. As Megumi cried with hiccuping sobs, Zoro held him tightly. Go away, you. Megumi said this, kicking Zoro with his feet. Of course, Zoro didn't feel any pain. But he let go of Megumi as he showed a gesture of refusal. Feeling unjust and resentful, Megumi huffed and glared at Zoro with teary eyes. You're mean, brother. Because of you. Because you, Megumi. Startled by the sudden appearance of Toji, who had been silent, Megumi stopped crying abruptly. Toji, having overheard their entire conversation due to his exceptional hearing, carefully lifted Megumi from Zoro's embrace and comforted him in his own. He softly said, don't say mean things to your brother. Shia's death wasn't Zoro's fault, nor was it wrong for Zoro to have told Megumi about it. It was Toji who should have explained it, but found the memory too painful, so Zoro did it in his stead. Zoro won't be hurt by just being blamed, but for Megumi's sake, it's better to stop him from saying such things. It's best not to say or do things you might regret, Megumi. By the time you want to correct them, it might be too late. That was one of the few truths Toji Zenin could teach his child. Ah, uh, Megumi no longer blamed Zoro and quietly sobbed. Toji slowly stroked Megumi's back. Zoro glanced at the sleeping Tsumiki and then back to Megumi. After a while, when the tears had stopped, Megumi looked at Zoro. Say sorry to him. Sorry, s sorry. It's okay? It really didn't bother him. Zoro reached out and gently stroked Megumi's hair. With a slightly anxious look, Megumi asked. But you won't die, right? Zoro hesitated, then smiled bitterly. Everyone dies someday, Megumi. No matter how strong someone is, even if they're the strongest, they can't avoid death. Even those who had evaded death in various ways in their previous lives, in the end, faced it. Having already experienced death once made Zoro even more reluctant to simply say, I will. Megumi's complexion turned pale. No, don't die. Zoro couldn't promise something he might not be able to keep. Despite Megumi's pleading not to die, Zoro couldn't just say, okay. He just stayed by Megumi's side. Continuously, Megumi was laid to bed, exhausted from crying. Toji went to the kitchen to make a cold wet towel, and wiped around Megumi's reddened eyes, quietly saying, weren't you a bit too harsh? He was still a child. It was natural to feel anxious about the death of a mother and fear that other family members might also die. He could have lied to reassure him by saying that he wouldn't die. Zoro looked tiredly back at Toji. Can you promise me that you will never die? See, everyone dies eventually, especially for people like Zoro and Toji. Their lives are practically on the edge of a knife. They couldn't possibly make a promise never to die. If they said they wouldn't die and then died, that would be a huge shock to Megumi as well. Being honest was the best Zoro could do. That's not to say it was the right thing to do. It's hard. Couldn't there have been a better way to tell him? A way to lessen the pain a little. But the death of a family is inherently tragic, and the grief of loss is also a part of love. It was just heartbreaking that this had to happen to Megumi. I'm sleepy. Then sleep. Toji stroked Zoro's head. Zoro held the small, cold-up body of Megumi in his arms and tried to fall asleep. It was a particularly longing day. For the next few days, Megumi quietly lingered around Zoro without saying much. Zoro didn't explicitly point out his anxious behavior and quietly accepted it. Then, on the day before Toji's birthday, Megumi sat quietly next to Zoro, who was training at home, and softly said, 
I want to see Mama. Zoro's lifting of the weight stopped abruptly in midair. That was significantly different from the I miss Mama Megumi had been saying. Slowly placing the weights down, Zoro squatted to be at eye level with Megumi. Are you sure? No, it wasn't okay. Still, in Megumi's heart, the hope that maybe Mama would come back and the desire to hit Zoro for saying she wouldn't return coexisted. But still, he felt like he needed to see. Zoro carefully examined Megumi. Even when it seemed far off, at some point, they grow up surprisingly. There's no need to grow up so quickly. Mother and father too did they feel the same looking at me. I'm sorry. Silently watching his sibling, Zoro took out his cell phone from his belt and called Toji who was out on a mission. After hearing what Zoro had to say, Toji was silent for a moment before replying shortly, I'll be there soon, wait for me. True to his word, Toji soon returned home. Taking the children in the car, he drove straight to the cemetery where Chair was buried. Standing at the entrance of the cemetery, Toji covered his mouth with his hand. His stomach churned. It felt like everything inside him wanted to come up. His head throbbed as if it would split open, and he wanted to run away right then. But this time, he had to go. He had promised. If young Megumi could face it, there was no running away for him. Zoro took Toji's hand, and with his other hand, he took Megumi's. Together, they stepped forward. Chia's grave wasn't far. That's how Toji, for the first time, stood in front of Chia's grave. Chia's grave was clean. Of course, there were faint traces left by rain and weather, but because Zoro occasionally stopped by to water and clean it, it was neat. That was all. Beyond its cleanliness, there was no sense of anything special about the ordinary grave. However, the name inscribed on the tombstone was far too heavy. I'm here. Nothing more would have been needed if only she could tell him he was late. No matter how much he drank even in dreams, the face that never appeared before him didn't show up this time either. Standing still next to Toji, Looking at the tombstone as if he had forgotten how to breathe, Zoro placed down a bouquet of white flowers he had bought on the way. Megumi glared at the characters inscribed on the tombstone. She couldn't read them. The same was true for Tsumiki, who asked cautiously, what's the name? Tanaka Chia. Just as her name Chia, C colon, a thousand loves suggested, she was someone who gave much love. Megumi reached out to touch the tombstone. It felt no different from ordinary stone cool and slightly rough. He called out, Mama. But like any stone you might step over on the roadside, no sound came back. Only then did Megumi understand why Zoro had so clearly said that Mama couldn't come back. This wasn't Mama. Mama might be here a little, but that couldn't be Mama. As Megumi staggered and took a step back, Zoro caught him. Zoro closely observed Megumi's face, but there were no tears. He was still a young child, so it was natural he couldn't perfectly hide his sadness. He tried hard not to let it show, attempting to bear it alone, much like Zoro himself. Zoro sighed internally. Why did you have to be so much like me? He had never imagined feeling such sorrow seeing someone resemble him. Zoro then glanced at the tombstone, silently invoking her name in his heart. Chia, I'm showing her to you, Megumi. Am I doing the right thing? Being like me could make things difficult for this child. Zoro knew his path in life wasn't easy. Nobody knew that better than he did himself. Hence, seeing his younger brother trying to stifle tears in front of the grave of a loved one brought Zoro an indescribable mix of emotions. Sumiki hugged Megumi tightly, and Zoro, feeling a deep sense of gratitude and relief, met Megumi's gaze. Megumi. Megumi directly looked back at Zoro with reddened eyes, a change from a few days ago when he had clung to Zoro, anxious and clearly disliking being away from him. It was both bitter and regrettable, yet also something Zoro felt proud of. I'm your brother. No matter what dreams you chase, even if you spend time with others besides me, even if our paths diverge, and you aim for something different, even if we end up on opposing sides, no matter what anyone else might call you, I am still your brother. Zoro's way of life is filled with hardships, and Megumi, having observed and learned from him, would likely face many challenges as well. He couldn't promise to always be there for every moment, Moment. But, someday, when you're faced with a situation you can't handle on your own, remember to call for me, okay? Because I will be there, for you. Ayo. Unable to hold back any longer, Megumi burst into tears and threw himself into Zoro's arms. Sumiki, also crying, joined them in Zoro's embrace. Toji gently stroked Zoro's hair as he held his children. Zoro pretended not to see the fleeting tears in his father's eyes. It was the moment when the family was finally all together. Days passed, and Toji's birthday on the last day of the year was quietly celebrated. There were no grand celebrations or gifts, but being with his children was enough for Toji. Then, one day after Toji's birthday, it became January 1st. The beginning of 2006, Japanese high schools typically have three vacations a year. About a month of summer break from late July to late August, about two weeks of winter break from the end of December to early January, and spring break from the end of March to early April. However, in the Jujutsu world, 
Where overwork is the norm and neither the basic act on education nor the labor standards act applies, such breaks didn't exist. Regardless of the new year or the fact that the year end is Japan's typical resting period, students and teachers at Jujutsu High had to work. Thus, on January 1st, Toji went to work at Jujutsu High. Zoro, Sumiki, and Megumi followed him there. As the classroom door slid open with a tired expression, Jito spotted the three siblings, Zoro, Sumiki, and Megumi, seated inside. It had become almost as common to see these faces as his own classmates, prompting Jito to smile and wave. Hey! Hello, kids. Hello, Mr. Jito. Good morning. Suguru. Zoro, seated, gave a slight nod of his head. As Jito took his seat, he looked at Zoro and spoke. I've been thinking about this for a while. But you know, calling someone by their name without permission isn't good, Zoro. It's fine with me. But given Japanese culture, most people would find it very uncomfortable. Even Zoro sometimes called his father Toji. Toji didn't mind and would reply, Why do you call me that, my Marimo? But Jito was shocked when he first heard it. Zoro blinked as if hearing something unexpected. Does it bother you? Not to that extent, but then it's fine. Zoro was somewhat aware of the social nuances. Contrary to Jito's expectation, Zoro rarely called people by their names. The reason was simple. I'm bad at remembering names. Did the gorilla teacher only teach fighting? What was that? Nothing, nothing. Tap, tap. Suguru, with faint duck circles under his eyes, waited for his classmates while tapping on the desk with his fingers. Zoro closely observed Suguru's face and asked, What's wrong? You look tired. Jito was about to say it was nothing, but the moment he saw Zoro's face, he couldn't bring himself to say it. After all, Zoro had been the starting point of the worries that had dominated Jito's mind for the past few days. Suguru Jito was born and raised in a non-jujutsu sorcerer family. His parents and grandparents were not sorcerers, and not even those with awakened abilities were among them. Not just his blood relatives, but also his friends, teachers, and neighbors were all non-sorcerers. This meant that there was no one to explain or teach him for a long time. About the world that Jito sees, about the curses he faces, about the powers and abilities he possesses, and even about the existence of Suguru Jito himself. His parents loved Jito, but they could never fully understand him, so there was always a certain distance. Jito tried several times to explain to his parents what he saw and fought against, but every time, Seeing the faces filled with worry and anxiety, he eventually stopped. Seeing this, his parents looked at Jito with a relieved expression. So, Jito had no choice but to keep questioning himself, what he was doing and whether it was the right thing to do. Though, the answer had to come from himself in the end. Then, in his third year of middle school, Jito finally met other sorcerers and learned about the world of Jujutsu. He realized what his identity and the unconsciously collected curses meant. He had been helping non-sorcerers as a sorcerer. He wasn't wrong or unique. Non-sorcerers cannot kill curses. Only sorcerers like Jito can. Without sorcery, non-sorcerers are defenselessly subject to curses. In the face of curses, non-sorcerers are helpless victims. Therefore, Jito decided to collect curses as a strong sorcerer to protect the weaker non-sorcerers. Because killing curses is impossible without a sorcerer. Because it's something only the strong can do. If the strong act for the weak, and more of the weak survive as a result, surely a better world can be built. Just as Suguru Jito has done so far. But now, two non-sorcerers who were neither ignorant nor powerless against curses appeared, completely contrary to what he had thought until now. Zenin Zoro and Zenin Toji. If non-sorcerers can also become strong enough to kill curses, then Jito and sorcerers are not fighting for the weak. Even Zenin Toji who is currently on the side of the sorcerers, is clearly closer to being a villain. He has killed many sorcerers in the past. Death is not rare in the world of sorcery. While there hasn't been death around Jito yet, he has frequently heard of others dying. Is it for such people that sorcerers die fighting, in such a vain manner? Protecting non-sorcerers wearing the guise of weakness only to perish so futilely? His head hurt. No matter how much he thought about it, he couldn't find an answer. During the year end, when Jito returned home after a long time, he thought about discussing this issue with his parents but decided against it. They had difficulty accepting him being a sorcerer. Such a conversation would only make them pale. Shoko would probably tell him not to talk nonsense, and perhaps only teacher Yaga would listen seriously. But he hesitated. However, one thing was certain. I absolutely can't tell Gorjo. It might have been stubbornness. It was impossible for Jito to tell his close friend, whom he had repeatedly lectured about protecting the weak, that he now had doubts about that very belief, especially not someone other than himself. Feeling already surpassed in strength, losing his convictions seemed like he could no longer stand as an equal friend beside Gorjo. Hey Zoro. What? Caught off guard by his own call, Jito felt a moment of regret. But Zoro was already waiting for him to continue. Just as Jito was about to speak, bang. The classroom door burst open. Gorjo stood at the doorway puffing his cheeks and making a V sign. I have arrived. As always, he had a knack for breaking the tension. Jito turned to Gorjo with a sour look. Shoko entered the classroom behind Gorjo, who was blocking the door, 
by lightly jumping over Gorjo's long legs. Hello Jito, and you guys too. Hello, Yeri-san, Gorjo-san. Yo, although there were already assigned seats, Gorjo deliberately pulled an empty desk and chair to sit between Jito and Zoro. Gorjo, peering at Jito's face, tilted his head. Jito, you look particularly tired today. What happened? I just didn't sleep well. Don't worry about it. Ah. Had a sexy dream or something. Ha ha, Satoru. Jito realized his hand was already grabbing Gorjo's collar. When did you get there, my right hand? Good job. Jito, who had smoothly slammed Gorjo's face onto the desk by pulling his collar, was expertly ignored by Yeri. Here they go again, these trash. Of course, Gorjo, who had his limitless on, lifted his head from the desk without a speck of dust on him. Too bad. Didn't hurt a bit. Zoro, could you teach me how to break through the limitless? It seemed like making a mukbip rice and soup out of this guy would be satisfying. Maybe I should steal that weird cursed tool from the gorilla's armory. Cheeto seriously considered it. Gorjo jumped up. Ah, that's cheating. If anyone's going to teach it, it should be me first. I was the first to ask Satoru. Where did that come from? You might have asked first, but who was attacked first? I even asked Toji-sensei first. Then learn it from that gorilla. No way. I think this guy does it better. Too bad. I asked Zoro first. Yo, no way. Zoro, silently listening to their argument, let it in one ear and out the other. Neither he nor Toji had said anything about teaching them Haki. Yet here they were fighting among themselves. Megumi, playing with the paper rabbit Sumiki had folded for his birthday, covered his ears with his tiny hands. It's loud. It'll quiet down soon. Yaga is coming. Sensing his approach, Zoro looked towards the door. Be quiet. As if aged three years over the holiday, Yaga entered the classroom with a look that commanded silence. Chito and Yeri wisely kept their thoughts to themselves, but Gorjo blurted out without care. Well, Yaga sensei looks even older. It's not easy to look older with that face. Yaga clenched his fist, but ultimately didn't smack Gorjo on the head, knowing he would just defend with his limitless. Satoru, today you're assigned a solo mission with the assistant director. Hey, why? I wanted to go with Suguru. Gorjo grumbled. Yaga hesitated for a moment before saying, Satoru, because you've become a special grade sorcerer. Really, sensei? Yes. At the upper management meeting held at the end of the year, Gorjo Satoru's promotion to special grade was finally decided. With this, Gorjo became one of the only two special grade sorcerers. Since the other special grade sorcerer, Tsukumo Yuki, had gone overseas and disappeared without a trace, effectively, Gorjo Satoru was the only special grade sorcerer. Gorjo wasn't particularly surprised. He knew it. Only now. Those oldies are as slow as turtles. Despite all the fuss about whether he truly mastered the reverse technique, whether he could produce output worthy of a special grade sorcerer, and all sorts of other nonsense. Especially the opposition from the Zenin was fierce. Well, it's to be expected from a family that has been enemies for hundreds of years. The Zenin family was the most upset when I was born, and now that Gorjo Satoru has reached special grade at 16, it must be something they could never accept. And they couldn't accept that the one leading them out of sorcerers was a non-sorcerer who had left the house. After all, they were a bunch of morons, the Zenin family. Even giving them a pink diamond, they would throw it away saying it's not transparent. Gorjo harshly criticized the Zenin family in his mind. Shito cautiously raised his hand. If Satoru is going on a solo mission, does that mean I'm on a solo mission too? No, Jito, today you will be on a mission with another person. Who? Yaga hesitated for a moment. Then, he pointed at Zoro. Blink, blink. Jito and Zoro blinked in surprise. A moment later, both shouted in unison. What? Ha! Huh. So, it's kind of a rank assignment mission. Yes. Your mission, Suguru, is to supervise and protect Zoro. It's a second grade mission, not even a first grade mission that Jito usually takes on. The task is to assess Zoro's abilities and characteristics at the mission location, and if necessary, protect Zoro and return to the school to report. Although it was better than what he first heard, Jito was not completely convinced. Yeri stood up from her seat, walked away from the children to a more distant spot, and opened a window. Then she started smoking a cigarette, an uncommon act for her in the classroom. Yaga, who would usually reprimand her for this, said nothing today. You're a reverse curse user. You're highly likely to be targeted by cursed spirits. That's why we're protecting you. Long ago, at the age of 10, Yeri Shoko was suddenly separated from her parents and had to stay in the medical room of the main office for protection because she was a reverse curse user. Smoking her cigarette roughly, she remembered her past. Even Shoko Yeri, who was 10 years old at that time. Zoro was not even in double digits in age yet. He's got a tough fate. Feeling pity, Shoko took a throat lozenge from her pocket and tossed it to Zoro, who caught it reflexively. Thanks. Not knowing why but feeling thankful, he accepted it. Gorjo grumbled too. How do they assess grades like this? The main office is totally messed up. Normally, when measuring a sorcerer's grade for the first time, 
they check the person's curse technique and the amount of energy. Then, they observe how the curse technique is used or refer to past experiences of using the curse technique. But Zoro is a non-sorcerer. His energy is minimal, and he doesn't have a curse technique at all. Naturally, the upper management found it difficult to assign a grade. Therefore, the main office decided to assign Zoro a mission to accurately assess his strength, ability, and grade. Of course, since he's quite young, under the supervision and protection of a first-grade sorcerer. That's just the official reason. Yaga thought to himself. Considering Zoro has already single-handedly slashed three special grade curses, there have been plenty of opportunities to confirm his strength. They just didn't want to accept it. The existence of a non-sorcerer is powerful as a sorcerer. That's why they hope Zoro leaves the world of sorcery. It doesn't necessarily have to mean death. That would be too ugly. After all, the main office is funded by the government of non-sorcerers. If they really wished him dead, they wouldn't have sent Jito with him nor would they have explicitly written in the official document. If Zoro refuses, do not insist and send Jito alone three times. What they truly hope for is that Zoro will refuse the mission, whether out of disobedience or fear. If Zoro tries to return to the sorcery world after growing further, they can block him by citing his previous refusal to comply with the sorcery world. I cannot accept this, sir, Jito said with a stern face. Regardless of his power, Zoro is a non-sorcerer. Moreover, he's only six years old. There's no reason for him to accept a mission to fight curses. Jito acknowledges Zoro's power, even knowing it's strong enough to rival Gorjo at his current state. But Zoro is just six years old, not yet enrolled in elementary school. Assigning a mission to such a child, even with a first grade sorcerer attached. Jito's argument was sound, leaving Yaga rubbing his forehead. Yaga had been shouting something similar at the upper management over the phone just moments before. This could result in Zoro developing a negative impression of the sorcery world. Perhaps they're hoping a bit more for that, Yaga thought to himself. The upper echelons certainly do not welcome the emergence of a non sorcerer capable of fighting curses, especially the Zenin family. It's not Zenin. It's not a sorcerer. If it's not a sorcerer, it's not human. This saying has been passed down for a long time. It's not rare for sorcerers from prestigious sorcerer families to have pride in their lineage and a sense of superiority. However, the Zenin are particularly notorious for it. With non-sorcerers continuing to emerge even within the Zenin, it's no wonder they find it irksome. Either comply with the mission and risk danger, or quietly disappear from this world forever. Yaga understood the upper echelon's intention. Of course, so did Zoro. I'm disappointed, sir. Stop it, Suguru. Zoro intervened to stop Jito. Zoro glanced briefly at Yaga. Someone was yelling from the direction of the staff room earlier, so it was about this. With Toji out on a mission, it was clear that Yaga was the one who had been angry. Meaning, he neither intended nor planned nor condoned this incident. There's no point in taking it out on the wrong person. If targeting someone, it should be those who concocted and executed this plan. After pondering for a moment, Zoro asked Yaga, Does my father know? I talked to him just now. That simplifies things, Zoro thought to himself and took out his phone from his pocket. The call was picked up immediately by Toji. Did you hear? I heard. Looks like those old farts in the upper echelons are reaching to return to the dirt. Toji's voice from the other side sounded relaxed yet ominous, like a hunting dog tensed and ready to leap at any enemies of its master. What shall I do for you? To Zoro's contemplative question, Toji subtly inquired. I don't particularly want to become a sorcerer. Coming to the school was because he quite liked it here, not because he wanted to be a sorcerer, or to impress the upper echelons. If the upper echelons refuse to accept him, it's not like he plans to quietly disappear. If anyone should disappear, it's them. Know that. So, should I just wipe out all those guys up top? Let's do the mission first. Want to see their faces? He wasn't thrilled about doing exactly as the upper echelons commanded. Zoro clicked his tongue. Toji, too, was surprised Zoro intended to go through with the mission and asked in a surprised voice. You're really going to do it? Something leaves a bad taste. It was Zoro's intuition. It seemed like it would be extremely bothersome if he didn't go. And that guy seems a bit off too. Zoro had noticed that Jito seemed about to say something important earlier. And that he was wavering. What it was about or why he was wavering, Zoro couldn't say. But since he seemed uneasy, Zoro didn't want to send him off alone to a place that gave him such a strong uneasy feeling. Reading the firm decision in Zoro's voice, Toji knew he couldn't dissuade him. Then, the only option was to go together. Give me the location of the mission. I'm coming too. What about work? You're much more important than that. Well, that's true. Zoro relayed the location he had received from Jito. See you there? Okay? After hanging up, Zoro looked back at Yaga. I'll do the mission. Please take care of my siblings. Zoro, that's it's okay. 
I might be a kid, but I'm not weak. Unable to deny Zoro's following words, Jido stayed silent. Gorjo sprawled across the desk, whining. I wanna go with Sugoro and Zoro too. Are you three years old? Get a grip. Wall. Gorjo. Grabbing Megumi next to him like a doll and rubbing his face against Megumi's spiky hair, elicited a deep sigh from Megumi. Be patient. So mean. You know how many people covet my embrace. I'm not one of them. Megumi hopped down from Gorjo's embrace and quietly returned to his seat. At that moment everyone in the room thought Megumi seemed older than Gorjo. Lipping his lips in frustration, Gorjo suddenly turned. Oh, right. If we're going to sweep up the rotten oranges together, you have to call me, okay? Rotten oranges, Satoru. Why, isn't it true? Just one rotten orange can quickly spread mold to the others. If those are swarming, even one or two good oranges will soon rot. Zoro, looking somewhat appalled, asked. I mean, it's one thing for me since I'm not a sorcerer. But can you really say that, Satoru? Don't worry about it. Concerns like the backlash from opposing the upper echelons, the operational vacuum after dealing with them, or the resentment from other ordinary sorcerers. It wasn't that such thoughts didn't cross his mind. Likely, sweeping away the upper echelons would cause significant turmoil. But Gorjo glanced between Jito and Zoro. I just can't see us losing. No, it's impossible to lose. Failure was not an option. With them together, there was nothing Gorjo couldn't do. With the strongest, Satoru declared confidently with a sure smile. Faced with his friend's shadowless laughter, Jito couldn't help but smile along. Showing off. Yeri snuffed out his cigarette stub with a harsh remark. Well, those two garbage bags did fit the bill, after all. Asterisk this is a side story where Zen and Zoro, 18 years old, finds himself in the original Jujutsu Kaisen universe. This is not part of the main story. Asterisk it's Zen and Zoro who has been reincarnated, not Rorono as Zoro. This story follows Zoro who has grown up to 18 years old in his second life and finds himself in the world of Jujutsu Kaisen. Asterisk of course, he's overpowered. Asterisk future main story developments may be spoiled. However, the developments in this side story may not perfectly match those in the main story. Asterisk Nanami melting away Asterisk smashing through the original Jujutsu Kaisen narrative. Nanami Kento discovered something immediately after enrolling in the Jujutsu High. Sorcerers are terrible. Seeing a white-haired senior introducing a much younger green-haired boy as your senior, Nanaman. To him, 15-year-old Minami Kento realized he had truly entered a dreadful place. The truly astonishing part was that Gorjo Satoru wasn't exactly wrong. Squinting his grey eyes and looking up at him, the green-haired boy, who ended up enrolling in Jujutsu High later on, was technically Nanami Kento's junior but until then, he was practically a senior. It made no sense for a 15-year-old to be taught practical experience by a 6-year-old. But in the world of sorcery, it was possible. Especially if that 6-year-old was Zen and Zoro. Indeed, sorcerers are terrible. Nanami sighed internally. And yet, staying in this terrible place makes me no less abnormal. Nowadays, sorcerers, except for the special grades, could freely retire. This was due to the decrease in higher grade curses over the past few years. Thanks to the efforts of various special grade sorcerers, the overall level of sorcerers had also improved significantly. Yet, staying in the sorcerer world was entirely Nanami Kento's choice. Step, step. He moved forward through the damp sower, stepping on the thick layer of black ash on the ground. It was all that remained of the curses that had been exterminated. At the end of the dark sower, an undeniable presence was felt. Nanami instinctively ignored the chill running down his arms and continued forward. Ever since he learned to harness his energy, it had become a common occurrence. Swoosh. The head of a curse resembling a giant snake was neatly sliced off and rolled toward Nanami's feet. It immediately turned to ash right before Nanami's eyes. Ah, sorry. With a thud, the body of the curse, as massive as a building, staggered. Whoosh. A young man who was standing atop the body leaped down. Jumping from a height equivalent to three stories of an apartment and landing lightly, the man sheathed his black sword with a click. With hair as fresh as green grass, three swords at his waist, a muscular body. A tall stature, a dark blue school uniform over a white shirt, and a yellow badge engraved with the emblem of Jujutsu High. It was Zen and Zoro. Zoro casually started a conversation. Yo, Nanaman. Please don't call me that, Zoro-kun. Zen and Zoro chuckled at Nanami's sharp response. Unlike Gorjo, who consistently ignored Nanami's requests and called him Nanaman, Zoro would stop using the nickname if firmly told not to. Though it was unavoidable to hear it once or twice at the beginning. What's up, Kento? That's what I'd like to know. What were you doing here? Alone. Nanami held back those words. Never let Zoro walk alone was kind of an unwritten rule in Jujutsu High. Whether it was family like Toji, Megumi, or Tsumiki, an assistant supervisor helping with Zoro's missions, classmates sent to accompany Zoro outside the school, or seniors and juniors from the school, someone had to always be with Zoro. Otherwise, he would immediately become lost just like now. Zoro scratched the back of his head and said, the assistant supervisor disappeared, and as the building moved curses appeared, I killed them. It wasn't the assistant supervisor or the building that disappeared, Zoro had simply wandered off the correct path. However, Nanami didn't point that out. 
No matter how much you correct him, it won't stick in his head. Especially not in Zoro's head, who is considered the strongest swordsman in history. How many curses were there? One special grade, and at least 20 of lower grades. That's definitely strange. With six active special grade sorcerers, though one is abroad focusing on research, and an increased number of non-special grade sorcerers, the current assessment is that there are more sorcerers than curses. The situation with 20 curses swarming in the Soa was definitely not normal. Let's go for now. The assistant supervisor is waiting. Nanami recalled the assistant supervisor who had been grumbling that one should never take their eyes off Zoro, wondering how they were supposed to find him again if he wandered off. When Zoro willingly followed Nanami, be careful. Noticing something, Zoro urgently pushed Nanami away with his scabbard. Turning around, Nanami saw a mirror-like artifact on the ground, emitting a dangerously high level of cursed energy, almost equivalent to a special grade sorcerer. Had Zoro not pushed him away, Nanami would have been undoubtedly engulfed by it. Strangely, Zoro, who could have easily dispersed the cursed energy, did not escape from it either. Zoro-kun. Just as Nanami called out, Zoro's figure vanished. The whirlwind of cursed energy that had swallowed Zoro also abruptly stopped. Damn, it wasn't a seal. Nor was it extinguished. That wouldn't happen to him. He had been transported somewhere. Nanami quickly took out his cell phone. What Zoro saw was a blue sky and a black curtain spread below him. He internally clicked his tongue. I knew it would be something like this. So it was a charm containing a technique that transported its target to a specific location. Though he didn't know why such a charm appeared there or where it was supposed to transport him. He couldn't let Nanami be affected. Zoro was confident he could survive regardless of where he landed, but the same couldn't be said for Nanami. In fact, Zoro could have easily slashed through the swirl of cursed energy with his sword. Yet, he didn't escape because he saw Megumi's injured face amidst the energy. It didn't seem like a mere illusion created by a technique. It looked real. I let my guard down. I need to train harder. Even as he fell through the air, Zoro thought this calmly. Whoosh. As he fell, Zoro prepared for impact. But the curtain didn't stop him, and let him pass through seamlessly. Thud. Zoro landed lightly and looked around. It was a familiar place, one he had visited frequently since he was a child. It was the forest located in Tokyo Jujutsu High, and within the storm of cursed energy, Zoro saw Megumi in the same state as he had envisioned. Megumi. Megumi, Maki, Itadori, Todo, and a special grade curse they hadn't seen before, were in a standoff. Megumi was injured, sitting by a stream with several thorns growing out of his upper body blood dripping from his mouth. It didn't make sense for Megumi to be so powerlessly overwhelmed even by a special grade curse. Pushing aside that question, Zoro quickly ran towards Megumi. Stop. Hanami suddenly appeared, blocking Zoro with caution. Given Hanami was wearing the same black school uniform as the others, it was clear he was an enemy. The cursed energy I sense from him is among the weakest here, on par with the woman wielding the triple section staff. But there was something different about him. You are ignoring the odd noise in his head, Zoro nonchalantly bypassed Hanami and continued running. Hanami, not expecting to be ignored, blankly watched Zoro run past him, reaching Megumi. Zoro knelt on one knee by the stream, not caring if his pants got wet to meet Megumi's eye level. Are you okay? The moment their eyes met, Zoro felt an unavoidable sense of unease. Something was off. The look in Megumi's eyes was like seeing a stranger, and the presence he emitted was weaker than the last time Zoro had seen him. Not just Megumi, everyone there was on guard, treating Zoro like a stranger. It was unsettlingly strange. However, with Megumi injured right before him, all other concerns had to be put aside for later. Zoro examined Megumi. He seemed tired and had strange thorns protruding from his stomach, but vital organs appeared to be untouched. If we just remove the thorns, Shoko can heal him right away with her reverse curse technique. Having made his assessment, Zoro slung Megumi over his shoulder. Naturally, Fushiguro Megumi, having no idea who had just abruptly picked him up, struggled. Who? No, more importantly, watch your back. Back. Ah. Uh, Zoro briefly glanced at Hanami. He was tougher than expected for still standing. But that was as far as he would go. But that was as far as it would go. Zoro spoke bluntly. It's fine. I've already cut him. Hanami groped his upper body with his only arm, feeling something was off. And that premonition was correct. With a slicing sound, Hanami's perspective bizarrely lowered. Looking down, he saw his upper body was bisected. A cut from his shoulder to his side caused the divided upper body to tilt and slide off along the cut surface. Ah. Uh, even as Hanami screamed from the delayed pain. He couldn't grasp the situation. Why? Why was his body cut in half? When? How? When that man brushed past Hanami. He hadn't even heard the sound of the sword being drawn. To think I was cut so swiftly that even I, the one being cut, didn't notice. Fear crept over Hanami. Not fear of his own death. 
but the certainty that the world they desired would never come as long as he existed. The world curses desired would never arrive as long as he was there. Feeling anger, confusion, and injustice, Hanami reached out towards Zoro. You, just who are thud? Before he could finish speaking, Hanami's bisected upper body fell to the ground. Then both the cut upper and lower bodies turned into black ash and scattered. The sorcerers of the high school were left speechless, unable to find words. The special grade curse they had fought so fiercely against had fallen in an instant, and they couldn't comprehend what had happened. Only one thing was clear to them. The young man with green hair and swords had caused it. Zoro approached Maki with Megumi hoisted on his back. Do you need to be taken to the infirmary too, Maki? No need wait. Who are you? Zoro frowned, which might have been interpreted as anger by Maki, as she flinched and clenched her teeth trying not to show any tension. A reaction that would never normally come from Maki. Is this some kind of collective amnesia, or is it really the first time seeing me? The first to snap out of it was Itadori, just as he tried to rush towards Megumi. Fushigoro, stay put, my brother. Toto grabbed Yuji by the shoulder. Cold sweat was running down Toto's face. He's strong. Uncomparably stronger than the special grade curse that just died. Even if my brother and I teamed up, no even if all the sorcerers here in perfect condition teamed up, they couldn't win. Absolutely not. Only someone like Gorjo Satoru could possibly stand against him. Listen to me, rookie. With a suddenly emerging Sukuna's face on his cheek, Yuji frowned. What's up, Sukuna? Stay back. Disappointing. To think you wouldn't notice even this. Sukuna, appearing on Yuji's cheek, spoke coldly, glancing fleetingly at Zoro. He hadn't explicitly shown it to avoid startling these weaklings, but his power far surpassed everyone present combined. That included the current Sukuna. So, he was the leader. Sukuna sneered, recalling the annoyingly white sorcerer talking about the higher-ups. It would be problematic if Fushiguro Megumi were to die. At least, there was no way to prevent that now. Since Maki had refused, Zoro stepped back. There were plenty of other sorcerers around to support Maki, besides Zoro. Suddenly, the barrier lifted. It was a bit later than Zoro had expected. What was everyone doing? Put Megumi down. Will you? A chilly voice descended from the sky. Gorjo Satoru, clearly visible to the naked eye, descended from Madair. Gorjo frowned. Not a sorcerer. No techniques. To the naked eye, only an utterly ordinary non-sorcerer was in sight. Not even six eyes. Yet, Gorjo found it impossible to ignore this man and walk away. And the moment he faced Zoro, Gorjo was sure of his decision. What is this? Feeling chills all over his body, Gorjo let out a scoff. How long had it been since he felt threatened by someone? In truth, there had only ever been one such individual in the past. Gorjo looked at Zoro, who held Megumi preciously, and hummed. Taking hostages is stupid. Do you think I can't kill you just because I want to keep Megumi alive? Zoro realized something was terribly wrong. Anyone who knew Zoro would never assume he'd take Megumi hostage. Nobody would. He sighed. Life was never quiet, was it? I can't put Megumi down. Not until I take him to Shoko. Huh? Ah, look, he's hurt. Treating Megumi and the students was the priority. Fortunately, it didn't seem like anyone was critically injured here. But injuries were still injuries. The discussion could wait. But first, gotta catch the rat. Zoro's grey eyes glinted with a crimson killing intent. Whether Gorjo tensed up or not, Zoro drew his sword. Then, he launched a massive slash into the forest. Swoosh. The slash, towering twice the height of the thick trees planted around Jujutsu High, split the forest with a blue line, connecting directly to the opposite side of the school. The slash, which had not cut down a single tree despite Despite its massive size and power, aimed precisely at Mahito, who had retreated upon the barrier's disappearance. As Mahito ran, a gigantic slash blocked his path, turning everything in his vision blue. Ha! Huh. Swoosh! Mahito was precisely bisected, dying without understanding what had happened. Zoro, sheathing his sword, clicked his tongue. Missed the other one. The students stood clueless about what Zoro had done. Naturally, they could never have imagined a slash reaching all the way to Mahito on the opposite side, without cutting a single tree in the forest. Gorjo, realizing belatedly what Zoro had accomplished, chuckled wryly. From this distance, to sense a curse's presence on the opposite side, and send a slash aimed only at it, hitting the target. And all that without the use of energy or techniques. Who are you? Zoro Roronoa. Briefly stating his name, Zoro, feeling Megumi's increasingly labored breathing, grew irritated. Hurry up and tell me where the infirmary is. We'll have plenty of chances to talk after treating the kids. Gorjo narrowed his eyes. It didn't seem like a lie. After all, if someone of his caliber wanted hostages, it's unnecessary. If he so wished, he could kill everyone here, excluding Gorjo, without breaking a sweat, and he didn't seem inclined to do so at all. Gorjo half gambled with his next words. I'll take Megumi to the infirmary myself, then come here. Surprisingly, Zoro obediently handed Megumi over to Gorjo. It was evident from his careful handling that he didn't want to startle or injure Megumi further. Fushiguro Megumi, now in Gorjo's arms in a princess carry, demanded an explanation. Gorjo sensei, what's going on? Do you know that person? That's what I'd like to know, Megumi. Who is he that he treat you this way? Gorjo, with questions swelling in his mind, headed for the infirmary. 
After the barrier was lifted, the faculty of both Tokyo and Kyoto Jujutsu High Schools scrambled to assess the damage and understand the situation. With a special grade curse wreaking havoc inside a barrier cast over the students participating in the exchange event between the two schools, the sorcerers from both institutions had no choice but to focus their attention there. Meanwhile, someone stealing six of Sukuna's fingers and the first to third cursed womb. Death paintings stored at Jujutsu High. Several sorcerers guarding the place were also killed by the intruder. However, it was believed that the marauding special grade curse was exorcised. Not by someone from Jujutsu High, though. That concludes the report on the apprehended curse user. Next, I'll report on the unidentified intruder. Ijichi, standing alone before the seated key faculty members of both Jujutsu High Schools, turned a page of his report. Yoshinobu Gakyagenji asked, Ijichi Kiyataka, where is this intruder now? On the roof of the medical facility. When Gorjo brought Megumi to Shoko and saw him somewhat recover under Shoko's reverse curse technique, the man visibly relaxed. As soon as the students of Jujutsu High showed signs of discomfort around him, he quietly left the medical facility. Jumping onto the roof of the facility, he had been sitting there on watch ever since. Gakyaganji expressed his displeasure, unidentified intruder with unknown motives. Why hasn't this person been detained like the other curse users? Well, that's because, I objected, Gorjo interjected, raising his hand. Gakyaganji's expression soured as he turned to Gorjo. Why, Gorjo Satoru? First, the guy eliminated two special grade curses in the blink of an eye. One of them was even from across at Kakuyo, taken out cleanly from a distance. It's futile to confine him, he wouldn't simply comply. Attempting to forcefully confine him could lead to casualties on their side. If agitated, almost everyone here might fall to him, except possibly for Gorjo himself. Second, our prison wouldn't hold much power over him. Why is that? He's a non-sorcerer. Jujutsu High's prisons are primarily designed to suppress and diminish cursed energy and techniques. Though they can reduce pure physical capabilities to some extent, these features are significantly weaker compared to the suppression of cursed energy and techniques. Considering the size of the slash he sent, locking him up would be pointless. He'd likely just slice the prison in half and stroll out. Even if they took his weapons, would he really let them? Eh? Hey, no way. Are you sure, Gorjo? That's preposterous, everything you just said. It's not a lie, right Satoru? The sorcerers were all astonished, each voicing their disbelief. The sorcerers were all surprised and made their remarks. Satoru could understand. When that person sent a massive slash without any cursed energy, even Gorjo himself doubted his six eyes for a moment. 100% a non-sorcerer. I stake my eyes on it. The movement of that person when sending the slash, the path it took even the ashes of the cursed spirits it killed, Gorjo had scrutinized it all with his six eyes but there was no trace of cursed energy or techniques anywhere. U-Term asked in disbelief, is it possible for a non-sorcerer to kill cursed spirits without using cursed energy? Well, there are quite a few non-sorcerers who can see cursed spirits. And if they have a cursed object, it's not impossible. However, this person killed with a sword, not a cursed object. Correct. You're unusually smart today. U-T-A-H-I-M-E tilde u temples twitch with irritation, but she held back. Given the circumstances, Yaga groaned thoughtfully. So we have a non-sorcerer who's at least as strong as a grade 1 sorcerer, possibly on par with a special grade. It's logical to assume they're a threat on par with a special grade sorcerer. The room tensed at the headmaster Gakuganji's words. A special grade sorcerer isn't something to be taken lightly. It's a title reserved for the exceedingly rare among sorcerers who could potentially overthrow a nation on their own. That Gorjo Satoru, the only one present with the special grade title, emphasized the significance of such a ranking. Of course, Gorjo was an extraordinary figure even among special grades. Yutam, having calmed down, asked, is it really safe? To leave such a powerful and mysterious person near the students, it doesn't matter whether students are within Jujutsu High, Yudam. Gorjo, are you even a teacher? Acting like this Yudam finally exploded, lunging at Gorjo to shake him by the collar. Ijichi, sweating profusely, tried to calm her down. Please calm down, Ms. Yori. Gorjo didn't just leave that person unattended. He's bound by a pact. As long as that person is within Jujutsu High, he's bound to protect all faculty and students present in Tokyo Jujutsu High at this moment. Not just not harm, but actually protect. Yes, we didn't specifically ask for protection, but they initiated the pact themselves. Considering that, we can assume they don't have any malice towards us. Pacts aren't omnipotent. If someone wants to evade them, there are plenty of ways to do so. Ijichi clammed up. After all, Yaga wasn't entirely wrong. But they didn't seem like like a bad person. That was partly because of how the person concealed themselves when the student and assistant teacher were frightened another reason was the items he handed to Ajichi. Have you interrogated him about his identity? We only asked some basic questions. Name, age, affiliation, that's about it. What did he answer? He didn't say much. Instead he gave me these. What are those, Ajichi? Ajichi took out a small, square card and a round badge from his pocket and handed them to Gorjo. The staff member's eyes widened at the sight of the yellow badge and card, both marked with the distinctive emblem of Jujutsu High. These were 
were items unmistakably associated with Jujutsu High. Every student at Jujutsu High had won a student ID. Tokyo Metropolitan Curse Technical College. Student ID number 400001. Name, Zenin Zoro. Born on November the 11th, 1999. This certifies that the individual is a student of this school. Next to the stoic ID photo, a circle marked with the character, special, was distinctly visible. It indicated special grade sorcerer status. Poo ha 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 ha. Gorjo couldn't help but burst into laughter. Ah ha ha ha. Ha 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 ha. After a long laugh, Gorjo finally stopped and said, What's this? I was worried for nothing. He's my junior, isn't he? Gakuganji stared at the student ID, then turned his gaze to Yaga. Yaga, has there been a fourth year student like this at Tokyo Jujutsu High? No, Yaga had never heard of a student by this name, especially not a special grade, which would be impossible not to know about. Besides, all the fourth year students at Tokyo Jujutsu High had already died. The same was true for Kyoto Jujutsu High. Yutom asked, could the student ID be a forgery? That's a possibility but it's identical. The barcode on the student ID wasn't registered in Jujutsu High's database. However, everything else matched Jujutsu High's student IDs too closely. All right, Gorjo, smiling, clapped his hands and stood up. Let's not stay here. It seems like everyone has a lot of questions about our student. He concluded playfully. At that time, Zen and Zoro was lying on the roof of the medical facility, looking up at the sky. Zoro briefly gazed at the sky before closing his eyes. As soon as he did, a powerful sense of presence spread throughout Jujutsu High. The sky covered by Tenjin's barrier, students inside the medical facility, the bustling Shoko, and the sorcerers approaching this way Zoro, captured all their presences. Something was different. This place was indeed Tokyo Jujutsu High, but it wasn't the school where he had spent his childhood. Toji and Jito, who should have been here due to such an incident, and Zoro's classmates were nowhere to be seen. Zoro took out his younger brother's Vivid card from his pocket. Despite Megumi being seriously injured, Megumi's Vivid card was in perfect condition, unscathed even before being treated by Shoko. A place that looks similar but is somehow different in every way. Zoro knew what to call such a place. Have I come to another world? A parallel world? Or something like that? Then everything made sense. The people of Jujutsu High treating Zoro as if they were seeing him for the first time, and the intruding curses that dared to invade without considering Zoro's presence. They truly were seeing him for the first time, hence the unfamiliar and cautious behavior. The intruders hadn't taken him into account either. Maybe I was never born in this world. It wasn't surprising. Zoro was a summoned being. Being born was an anomaly, a defiance against heaven. Naturally, many people, knowingly or unknowingly, were involved in Zoro's life. Without Zoro here, naturally, many would have walked a different path from that of Zoro's world. Some might have found better outcomes, while others might not have. And some might have died disappearing altogether. Zoro scratched the back of his head. It sounded absurd, but living a life filled with absurd events wasn't new to him. Whether in his previous life or current life, Zoro, who had faced the absurd as if it were daily routine, accepted this situation as it was. Changing worlds isn't new to me. Only this time, it wasn't through death and rebirth. Recalling Nanami's look of horror caught between the storm of power, Zoro felt uneasy. I need to return quickly. But he had no idea how to go back. It would have been possible to try something with that mirror-like object if it had come with him. But it seemed to have remained in the original world. Zoro clicked his tongue, thinking like this wasn't his responsibility. Zoro, below, Gorjo called out, cupping his hands around his mouth. While the surrounding sorcerers were filled with suspicion and tension, only Satori remained calm and collected. Zoro leaped down to stand in front of Gorjo. Why? Oh, come on, that's cold. I'm your teacher, you know. The one teaching you. Of course, Zoro scoffed at Satori's words. As if. Gorjo had never taught Zoro anything. Nor could he have. I've taught people from Jujutsu High too. Though it wasn't part of the regular curriculum, anyone who wanted to learn about Haki or swordsmanship came to Zoro. Be it students or staff members, Zoro didn't refuse and taught them. It wasn't particularly difficult, and it was good for more people to learn Haki and swordsmanship. Gorjo's eyes sparkled with interest. Wow, what did you teach? Tell me. I'm curious about a lot of things right now. It seemed so. Zoro sighed at the overly eager gaze. This nutcase had gone crazy again. Since Zoro needed other people's help to find a way back to his original world, he had no intention of not explaining the situation. It wasn't something he needed to hide anyway. Just a moment before that. Bang. Hey, you were. When Zoro suddenly opened the door, Nabara and Yuji who had been eavesdropping closely, lost their balance and stumbled forward. Zoro caught them smoothly as they screamed and were about to fall. After setting them straight, Zoro sternly said, Eavesdropping on others isn't good. Sorry. We're really sorry having received their apologies. Zoro didn't scold them further and gestured towards the inside of the building with his chin. Let's talk inside, in front of Megumi. 
Hum, you don't want to talk with Megumi alone. It's annoying. He disliked repeating the same story several times. Once was enough for him. Zoro hesitated as he saw Nabara and Yuji's eyes sparkling with curiosity. He sighed. If you want to listen, you can come too. Is that okay? It's not something to hide. It was just a bit hard to believe. Zoro spoke briefly. Let's go inside. There was a lot to discuss. He entered the medical facility and walked in. Shoko, don't you have popcorn here? Shut up, Gorjo. Following Shoko's advice that too many people in the medical room could adversely affect the students who had just recovered through reverse curse technique, only the faculty members Yaga, Yudam, Gakiganji, and Gorjo were allowed in. Shoko, naturally, was already there as the medical rooms assigned. Additionally, Megumi was sitting on a hospital bed covered with a blanket with Nabara and Yuji on a guardian's bed next to it. On the opposite side, Maki, Panda, and Inumaki sat on another hospital bed, looking on with a mix of tension and interest. Zoro, surrounded by these people, pondered briefly what to say. Then, he explained bluntly, I'm Zen and Zoro. Zen and Megumi's brother and a swordsman. I'm from another world, a fourth year student at Tokyo Jujutsu High, and my rank is special grade. Nice to meet you. Ha 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 ha. What? What did he say? Ha! Huh. That's a hell of a straight pitch. Salmon. Everyone was taken aback, and Megumi's green eyes looked as if they were hit by a void, unable to process the information just heard. A brother. His brother from another world. Special grade. A ha ha. Ha 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 ha. Megumi, your face is hilarious. Ha ha ha. Gorjo was the only one rolling on the floor with laughter. Seeing Gorjo, wrapped in an infinity, rolling around at her feet, Shoko's face soured dramatically. It's so hard I could die. Analyzing the cause of death, ensuring the corpses weren't used for curses, and treating the patients was stressful enough, and now she had to watch Gorjo roll around near her feet. Her dark circles, which had already reached her cheeks, seemed to deepen further. The urge for a cigarette she had quit a while ago came rushing back. Such white trash. Imagine laughing because the intruder you were wary of turns out to be the brother from another world of your student. I want to clock out, medical duties be damned. Shoko thought blankly to herself. Maki questioned with skepticism. Is that even possible? Another world. How exactly? I didn't come here by choice. I was swept up by the energy emanating from some mirror-shaped artifact, and next thing I knew, I was here. Gakuganji looked bewilderedly at Yaga. Is such a thing really possible, Yaga? Under normal circumstances, Yaga would have flatly denied such a possibility. However, astonishingly, this time he couldn't dismiss it outright. Coincidentally, on a side, the repository at Time Vessel Association was invaded, resulting in the destruction of many artifacts. Among them were artifacts related to worlds and movement. If the destroyed artifact from that world interacted with an artifact from this world during the process, it's not entirely impossible. Panda looked at Zoro curiously. So you're really a senior from a parallel world. That's fascinating. There's no brother of Fushiguro in this world. That would make sense. Zoro is a summon being. If he had been in this world too, it would have been more surprising. Inyamaki looked at Zoro worriedly before speaking. Unripe salmon. Well, I've been through a lot. I'm okay. Inyamaki's eyes widened in surprise, not expecting Zoro to understand and respond to his onajiri language question. Itadori looked thoughtful. So Fushiguro from another world, no, you said Zenin there. Anyway, you're Megumi's brother and a senior. Yeah. Zenin, like Senior Maki. Is that so? Considering this world's Megumi became Fushiguro, Zoro thought this world's Maki might have changed her surname too. But it seemed Maki was still a Zenin in this world. What are you looking at? When Zoro looked at Maki, she retorted sharply. Zoro just shrugged and turned away. It wasn't a matter of great importance, after all. Itadori rested his chin on his hand, pondering. If we call you Zenin Senior, no. That overlaps with Maki. What should we call you? Call me whatever you want. Zoro didn't really care what he was called, though it was rare for others to refer to him as Zenin. The first reason was that he often and spent time with Toji, Megumi, and Maki, and calling him by his surname could lead to confusion, since they were all Zenins. The second reason was that people were cautious about referring to Zoro as Zenin, fearing they might offend him. Given what Zoro had done to the Zenin family in the past, there were hardly any sorcerers who didn't know about it. Itadori clapped his hands cheerfully and said, then Senior Zoro. Zoro's eyes widened, then he chuckled. In his world too, Yuji had called him that. Senior Zoro. Recalling the face that used to call out to him with hands raised high, Zoro smiled. Some things don't change, even when worlds do. Nabara looked uncomfortably at Fushigo Megumi. From the color of their hair to their facial features and physique, there was no resemblance between the two. After looking back and forth between them for a while, she finally spoke up. Sorry. If this is a rude question, but don't you two look too different to be brothers? Megumi is the spitting image of her father. Megumi, except for his build, was a spitting image of Toji. While Zoro, if you exclude the physique, didn't resemble Toji at all. Hence, it made sense that they didn't look alike. Hearing the word father, Fushigoro's expression instantly hardened. He said stiffly, I don't have something like a father. He left when I was too young. 
so I don't remember his name or face. He didn't find that regrettable. After all, Fushiguro Megumi didn't value the man much. Zoro looked at Fushiguro with an indifferent gaze. There was no sign of reproach or anger, just neutrality. Seeing that face somehow made Megumi more irritated, and he blurted out, My biological father abandoned Tsumiki and me before I even entered elementary school and vanished. Around the same time as Tsumiki's biological mother, Fushiguro Megumi felt a lingering rough sensation in his mouth. It was a fact he had accepted long ago, yet it left a bitter taste. Bye. Now, he's probably somewhere living well. A man who didn't even know the gender of his children, naming one Megumi of all things. Such a man was nothing like a father. As Megumi finished speaking, an awkward silence filled the infirmary. Maki looked somewhat uncomfortable, and Toge was at a loss for words, saying nothing. Panda was. Being Panda, and Nabara seemed taken aback by the unexpected story, as was Itadori. The faculty members also kept their mouths shut. Being adults and teachers, they didn't want to pry into the wounds of a student abandoned by their parents with rash questions. Gorjo stared intently at Megumi. His expression was hidden by his eye patch, but he seemed mostly indifferent. Zen and Zoro looked at Megumi with an inscrutable expression, then spoke briefly and decisively. No, told you so, your father is probably not living well, as you think. Megumi was taken aback and retorted. What do you know to say that? How much do you know? At Zoro's counter, Megumi was left speechless. After all, it was true that Megumi didn't know much about his father. Even if the person right in front of them was from another world, he was still a brother who had the same parents as Megumi. Megumi, avoiding Zoro's piercing gaze, muttered, I know he's not a good person. That's correct. Itadori asked Zoro, who was nodding seriously, somewhat hesitantly. Is it okay to talk about your senior's father like that? It's the truth. Zoro had no intention of sugarcoating Toji as a good person. In the past, Toji was undeniably a villain. He vented his past frustrations on others and made money through murder. Despite that, he didn't treat his family well. Things have changed a lot now still. The sins of the past are not easily washed away. He would definitely go to hell if he died, just like Zoro. While harboring such disrespectful thoughts, Zoro spoke up. However, that doesn't mean your father will be living well after abandoning you. If Megumi's father is Toji in another world, he could never be well. Because Toji not being by Megumi's side means, in this world, she is dead. That signifies Toji's world has been utterly shattered. As Megumi said, it might have been better if he could forget everything, whether it's his dead wife or child, and live well. As Megumi said, it might have been better if he could forget everything, whether it was his dead wife or child, and lived well. But he could never do that. Because he couldn't let go of the first salvation that was bestowed upon him. Because he couldn't pretend to bury his first love as if it never happened. No matter what he did or where he was, that deficiency and loss could never be filled. Forever. To Toji, Cher was such a lover. The love that Toji and Cher shared was of that nature. And the child born from Toji and Cher's marriage could never be a being that Toji could just casually abandon. Even if everything else fell apart, this child seems unaware. It was perhaps inevitable. It's not exactly clear when Cher died in this world. But if she died around the same time as in Zoro's world, then Megumi would have been less than a year old at that time. What are you trying to say? Exactly what it sounds like, that your perception might be wrong. Megumi let out a sigh. On what evidence? Your name? Megumi. That was something he agonized over for months before deciding. Zoro clearly remembered Toji flipping through a kanji dictionary, whenever he had the chance, while Chia was pregnant with Megumi. In the end, he chose a common kanji for a common name, but the meaning embedded within it was anything but common. From the moment you were born, you were a grace, and that person, without even a bit of a curse to his name, was cursed. So, he gave you, a sorcerer, a name that's the exact opposite of a curse. A being that was a family's blessing and grace from birth. A being blessed with sorcery like no other. A being that from birth, was the exact opposite of Toji who was completely ostracized from his kin and the world, hoping that your life and fate would be as blessed as that overflowing love and effort. Megumi. Megumi's eyes wavered at the unexpected revelation. It was more confusing because he had thought all along that Toji had mistakenly given him the name Megumi thinking of his gender. After opening and closing his mouth several times as if trying to say something, Megumi finally managed to speak. But he's still a bad person and a bad parent. I won't forgive him. Embarrassed by such a childlike statement, Megumi blushed. However, Zoro accepted it coolly saying, is that so? Forgiveness is entirely Megumi's right and his heart. It can't be forced, nor was there any intention to do so. The reason for sharing this was simply because not forgiving someone with knowledge and not forgiving someone out of ignorance are different. If one hates without knowing and then it turns out that reality is the opposite of what was thought, the feelings harbored all this time would lose their direction. Megumi, with a complicated expression, hesitated before asking, Do you forgive your father? Zoro blinked twice before answering, No, I just beat him up and dragged him home. Bringing him home was the first step, and forgiveness, if it were to come, would be the next. Whether or not Zoro forgave Toji, the Toji he encountered in that moment was undoubtedly his father. If Toji was still their father, 
then he rightly belonged by their side. That's why Zoro had decided to knock him over the head with a spirit bone, and drag him home. I don't care why that man left us. As long as Toji was his father, Zoro had no intention of simply letting him go. You always do as you please, even when it comes to saving others, my little Marumo child. Zoro remembered something Toji had said in passing. And this is just speculation. But Zoro felt Megumi needed to know. So he spoke up, your father, he's probably dead. Eh? Really Zoro's bombshell remark elicited shocked reactions from all around. Yutum cautiously asked, don't tell me your father too. That guy is perfectly fine. To fine, actually. Toji had recently encountered a special grade spirit with a curse technique that was immune to physical attacks. Pretending to go on a mission but actually sneaking off to play pachinko, Toji was caught by Megumi and ended up going to work. Annoyed, he took it out on the unfortunate special grade spirit tearing it to shreds with nothing but his bare hands and bravado. And then he threw it in front of Suguru, saying if you want it, take it. Tearing apart a spirit and bringing it back barely alive was a feat in itself. The spirit was in such bad shape that it couldn't become one of Jito's underlings and was executed. Satoru asked why he was taking out his anger on the spirit instead of arguing with Megumi. But from Toji's perspective, Megumi wasn't someone to take his anger out on, so it made sense. He must have heard from Nanami by now. He definitely grabbed Zoro and shake him down the next time they met. He might even put him under a curfew. Because of you, my hair will turn white like the young masters. Huh? Hey, my little Marimo child. The voice of Toji grumbling about his disobedient, willful Marimo bouncing around came echoing in Zoro's mind. Nabara looked at Megumi who had turned pale, and cautiously asked, why do you think he's dead? He hastened his own end. Without any attachment to life, he accumulated karma that need not be accumulated and engaged in fights that need not be fought, driving himself into a corner. And if he faced a wall that couldn't be overcome, he would just die. Gorjo flinched faintly. Zoro seemed not to notice and casually continued. If he were alive, he would have returned to Megumi at least once. Months, maybe even years, might have passed, but he would have returned. Because, with Zoro not yet born, the only thing that would have been meaningful to that person would have been Megumi. Whether it was because of remaining attachments, simply to check if he was still alive due to the remnants of affection, or whatever, he would have come to see Megumi at least once. The fact that he didn't meant he couldn't, then he must be dead. Zoro coldly assessed the situation. Separate from that, something surged within him. Even though he didn't consider the Toji Megumi of this world to be the same as his father, the news of his death still felt bad. It hurt a little. Megumi wanted to deny Zoro's words but couldn't. He remembered what Gorjo had said to him when they first met long ago. It's irritating, isn't it? Having such a father. That's why I that's why. I I what did Gorjo do to his father? Megumi looked at Gorjo with wavering eyes. As their gazes met, Gorjo smiled his usual annoying smile. Upon seeing that smile, feelings of boredom and annoyance were replaced by fear and unfamiliarity in Megumi's heart. Gorjo san it's not possible, right? You couldn't have. You, to my father. But then Megumi remembered something else Gorjo had said. If you ever want to know about your father's affair, just ask. Thinking it would be quite interesting, he had ended the conversation like that. If it's about that why, did you Zoro quietly observe both Gorjo and Megumi? Yaga coughed deliberately, drawing Zoro's attention to him. Sorry, but I'd like to ask a question on this side. Go ahead, Satoru called you a non-sorcerer, is that correct? Zoro tilted his head in confusion. What's the definition of a non-sorcerer and a sorcerer? Is there a difference in meaning between them? Recently, the sorcery regulations have changed on this side. According to the recently revised sorcery regulations in Zoro's world, the definition of a sorcerer was as follows. An entity belonging to the sorcery headquarters or the sorcery classics, capable and willing to exorcise spirits and curse users with a multitude of abilities, including ample sorcery power, curse techniques, ten shadows technique, swordsmanship and other martial skills and physical prowess. Based on that definition, Zoro was undeniably a sorcerer. He might lack sorcery power and be unable to see spirits with the naked eye, but he was affiliated with the sorcery classics, and capable of exorcising spirits and curse users with his swordsmanship. Gorjo counted off on his fingers as he listed, low in sorcery power, unable to control the emission of sorcery power, lax or is unable to use innate curse techniques, and unable to see spirits. If those are the criteria, then yes. I'm a non-sorcerer. According to Gorjo, Zoro had very little external emission of sorcery power for a non-sorcerer. But nonetheless, the rest applied to him. Gakuganji frowned. How could a non-sorcerer who can't even see spirits get admitted to the classics? Zoro replied calmly, because I'm strong. How strong? Hard to say. In Zoro's world, Satoru did refer to Zoro as the strongest. The strongest. A title possessed by the strongest. However, in the sorcery world where Zoro resided, the title of the strongest wasn't exclusive to him. Three people held it. The current strongest sorcerer, Gorjo Satoru. The strongest swordsman of all time, Zenin Zoro. The strongest curse in history, Ryomen Sukuna. It wasn't unusual for there to be three 
individuals considered the strongest. In Zoro's previous life, there was also the world's strongest swordsman, the world's strongest man, and even among those not called the strongest, there were several who could stand up to those who were. Among those involved in the sorcery world, there was no one who didn't know these three were the strongest. However, if asked who the real strongest was among them, no one could answer. For one, Ryoman Sukuna had not manifested for over a thousand years, and was currently using Itadora Yuji as a host body, making neither Zoro nor Satoru a suitable opponent to fight with all their might. Neither in a complete state, and killing him would mean killing Yuji too. As for Zoro and Satoru, they had fought fiercely for a long time, but could never truly determine a winner. If they were to seriously fight, it would be dangerous. Dangerous for Zoro or Satoru, not just them. But in fact, the area surrounding their battle and the people living nearby were in greater danger. For example, if they fought in Tokyo Jujutsu High, not just the school but Tokyo, and potentially even Japan, could be split into three. Thus, they never went all out in their fights, except when Zoro was a child. Since neither side used their full power, considering the damage to surrounding buildings and people, the battles between Zoro and Satoru always ended in a somewhat lukewarm draw. It had been quite some time since they even did that much. Yet, Gorjo still called Zoro the strongest. Zoro himself did not claim the title of the strongest, as he hadn't clearly won against both Ryom and Sukuna and Satoru. As Zoro was pondering where to begin this story, he sensed a presence outside and looked in that direction. Gorjo also jumped up and stared out the window. In the open space right in front of the infirmary, a swirling blue energy was whipping through the air. Like the beginning of a tornado, the energy violently tore through the space, becoming increasingly vivid. Among the swirling energies, Satoru, sensing a certain energy, froze and could not take his eyes off the vortex. Hidden by the swirling energy, but unmistakably felt by Gorjo Satoru, was the presence of another sorcerer's energy. Although another sorcerer's energy was felt nearby, Gorjo could not focus on it at the moment. No, even if he hadn't felt the energy, Satoru would have known who it was. As long as he was Gorjo Satoru, he could not fail to recognize that person. The owner of the energy was his one and only close friend with whom he shared the most brilliant spring. Suguru is dead, though. No, that's the story in this world. Perhaps in Zoro's world, Suguru hadn't died. As this thought crossed his mind, memories overflowed in Satoru's head. The seemingly eternal blue season they had shared. The faculty, excluding Gorjo, immediately went into combat readiness. Itadori also shifted his gaze and was startled by the sight. What's happening, eh? What's that? Nabara silently gathered her nails. As the second year students were about to get out of bed, Zoro said, wait, stopping them. There's no need to panic. What? They're with me. It seemed that someone from Zoro's side had found a way back to his original world before Zoro did. Looks like they've come to pick me up. Crackle. The aftermath of the blue vortex tore at the infirmary's walls. Zoro stood in front of the beds where the students were and blocked the energy. Then, he swung his sword, dispersing the vortex. Hiss. The energy scattered like sand sparkling under the sun. However, Gorjo could clearly see the presence of the energy drawing closer. The space twisted, and then spat out a person onto the ground first. A man with blonde hair, wearing glasses, a beige suit with a tie, and holding a broadsword. Most people present knew him. Nah, Nanaman Itadori shouted the man's nickname. Nanami Kento, upon hearing himself called Nanaman, reflexively frowned, then slightly relaxed his expression, when he saw that Itadori was the one who had called him that. Please don't call me that, Itadori-kun. Whoa, it's really Nanaman. Nabara glanced at Itadori and said, You know him, Itadori. We've worked together. He's a grade 1 sorcerer. Yutahum, surprised to see a junior she hadn't seen in a while, asked Nanami, Why are you here? No, wait, are you the Nanami I know? The Nanami I know. It seemed Zoro had grasped his situation and shared the information. Thanks to that, explanations were likely to be a bit easier than expected. I'm afraid not, Yuri-san. I am Nanami Kento from another world. Why have you come here? I came to find a missing person. Nanami turned towards Zoro. Are you injured, Zoro-kun? Ah, well, if he had been injured, that would have been surprising in its own right. This is Zen and Zoro, after all. Do you know where you are, Kento? It's a parallel world temporarily connected by a curse. We've now created a bridge between the two worlds, allowing you and us to cross over. In essence, Nanami came to guide Zoro back. Since Zoro, on his own, couldn't return to his original world even knowing the two worlds were connected. He wasn't a sorcerer, and he was directionally challenged. Zoro glanced at where Nanami had emerged. He felt the presence of two very familiar entities beyond that space. Two more will be arriving soon. I know, but wouldn't you have been enough? Please don't say that. Zoro didn't know what reaction there had been when the news that he disappeared due to a curse was shared over the phone. Right. I shouldn't say that. My son. Toji appeared silently beside Zoro. Zoro caught every movement of Toji coming towards him from the split space. However, to the students, it seemed as if Toji suddenly appeared out of nowhere, which startled them. Whoa, wh who are you? This brat's father, Toji was grinding his teeth. After receiving a call from Nanami about Zoro being swept away by a curse, Toji, 
who had hurriedly returned from a mission, gathered information from several sorcerers at the school, and managed to get here with the help of barrier technicians. Knowing that Zoro had gone to a parallel world, but not how dangerous it was, he was extremely anxious. Son, don't we have something to discuss? Not really. That's not true, you directionally challenged Marimo. After finally going out on a rare mission and ditching the assistant supervisor to wander off alone, catching a special grave curse, and then disappearing due to a curse. The hours it took to figure out what happened, devise a plan, and finally reunite with Zoro felt like days. Always floating off on your own. This time, he had to straighten out his wayward Marimo child. Zoro expertly avoided Toji's scowling gaze. It seemed unlikely this would just blow over easily this time. Gorjo Satoru was about to turn his attention to the newly arrived Toji Zenin. Had his head not suddenly frozen at the sound of a voice, he surely would have. Zoro, you might want to listen to Mr. Toji this time. You were worried. Huh? A gentle male voice echoed. Yaga's face hardened. Could that voice be? The space twisted violently, and a young sorcerer appeared from a hole in thin air. All faculty members tensed up, and the second-year students looked ready to leap into action at any moment. It was Jido Suguru. He stood there, his hair tied up in a style reminiscent of Gorjo's memories of their bright spring days, wearing a neatly pressed suit instead of a school uniform or kasada, and appeared as mature as Gorjo. Jito stopped in his tracks upon seeing Gorjo of this world, his eyes widening. Then, with a smile, he raised one hand. Hey! Hello, this world's Satoru. Unlike Zoro, Jito Suguru and Zen and Toji had histories of operating as curse users in this world. Therefore, the sorcerers of the school immediately imprisoned the two in the school's jail. Surprisingly, both men complied with being imprisoned. They needed some time for the portal back to their original world to open, and there was no need to cause unnecessary friction with the people here. Jito, sitting cross-legged in the middle of a room filled with talismans, looked around, and his expression ambiguously changed. It wasn't bad. Not bad but Satoru. Is this the kind of jail you use for imprisoning special grade curse users? The jail was significantly more modest compared to the prisons made for curse users in their world, which were crafted using Jito's curse manipulation to contain special grade curses. It might suffice for imprisoning up to a grade 1 sorcerer. However, it was too frail for confining three special grade sorcerers at once. Not to mention, Zoro, who followed us into the jail, wasn't even restrained. Jito glanced at Toji and Zoro in the corner of the room. Zoro was kneeling next to the bound Toji had raised his hands, and then slowly lowered them. Toji, without looking at Zoro, said, keep your hands up properly. But I told you, I didn't do anything wrong. You did. How many times did I tell you not to wander off on your own while I'm on a mission? Then you step on some weird curse. Toji wasn't worried that Zoro would be defeated or killed. He was worried he'd get lost. It's not that I got lost, the building moved. How many years have you been making that excuse? You frustrating Marimo child of mine. Nanami, tied to a chair. Let the father-son argument go in one ear and out the other. I want to clock out. Desperately wanting to clock out? Perhaps it would have been more peaceful if only Nanami had been transported by the curse. After all, even if he hadn't been cursed, he would have ended up searching for Zoro in another world anyway. You still treat me like I'm six crack. Ah, uh, hey, troublemaking Marimo. Zoro had managed to snap the curse user restraint rope meant to bind Toji with just one strong stomp of his foot. Toji sighed and shook off the cumbersome rope. In any case, Toji could have easily freed himself from such a restraint if he wanted to. You're aging me, aging me. He couldn't take his eyes off him for a second without him causing trouble. Not that a less troublesome child wouldn't draw his attention. Toji thought back to Megumi, the one from this world whom they had encountered earlier. As if seeing something he had neither seen nor imagined before, with eyes shaking with unfamiliarity and distrust, he looked at him with green eyes noticing, and understanding the situation was Toji's instinct. Seeing Megumi's reaction made it clear that Toji didn't exist in this world. Probably Zoro as well. He must be dead. I am. For Zoro, Toji concluded that the possibility of never being born was higher. But if Zoro had been born and died early, it seems I wasn't born in this world. Is that so? That was somewhat relieving. Toji didn't want to imagine a world where Zoro died at a young age. Toji was well aware of how flawed he was. With Chair dead and Zoro not even born, there was no chance Toji would have diligently taken care of Megumi. At most, he would have left him at some relative's house or kindergarten, checking in once every few weeks or months. Still, it seemed Megumi managed to survive somehow. Whether he overcame everything on his own, or if Tsumiki, Gorjo, or someone else was there to support him, Toji didn't know. It was fortunate. What's wrong? Nothing. It wasn't something to discuss with Zoro, saying it was good that Megumi grew up well even without him. Jito shifted his gaze away from Toji and looked straight ahead. Since first seeing Jito, Gorjo hadn't said a word, just silently observing him. Even as Toji and Zoro conversed, he didn't look away once. Without wearing an eye patch or sunglasses, his blue eyes were fully exposed. Aren't you tired? Eh? It took a while for Gorjo to respond. Your eyes? You've been without sunglasses or an eye patch this whole time. Jito touched the corner of his own eye. Ah, not really. 
In fact, the whole situation felt like a dream to Gorjo. Yet, the energy reflected in his blue eyes was undeniably that of his one and only close friend. However, Satoru's soul felt a faint sense of dissonance. Different. The person in front of him was indeed Jido Suguru, but not the one with whom Gorjo had shared his youthful days. Satoru's close friend was dead. Suppressing the emotions welling up inside, Gorjo playfully smiled. I'm the strongest after all. Are you the strongest in this world? Gorjo blinked. Aren't you on your side? Well, you are called the strongest too. In our world, there are three people called the strongest. You, Zoro, Ryum, and Sukuna. Among them, you are referred to as the current strongest sorcerer. Actually, you call Zoro the strongest. Jito continued. Blink, blink. Gorjo blinked. A world where I'm not the strongest. Yeah. That's right. I've never thought about that. Gorjo was destined to be the strongest from birth, and indeed, he became the strongest. Neither Jito nor Toji, who once defeated Gorjo, could reach the position Gorjo held. Although he was earnestly aiming for reform and training disciples, there was no student who had reached a position equal to Gorjo's. Naturally, there was nobody who had become stronger than Gorjo. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it myself. Zoro has been fighting on par with you since he was young. What kind of guy is he? I don't really know. It seems like his father, Mr. Toji, doesn't know much about Zoro either. It wasn't just that he wasn't talking. It seemed there was a lot he genuinely didn't know. Or maybe he's just not trying to find out. Though they often bicker over trivial things, when Zoro makes a serious decision, Toji simply follows. It seemed like he greatly disliked and avoided doing anything that could spoil their relationship. Gorjo stuck out his tongue. Oh, that guy is a teacher. That's upsetting. I'm a teacher too. You too. Yeah. I used to be Zoro's homeroom teacher at one point, and now I'm in charge of the second years. Second years? Huh, that's curious. In this world, you and the second years fought like you wanted to kill each other. Gorjo didn't say it aloud, but mulled it over internally. As the conversation progressed, Jito quietly observed Satoru's increasingly summer expression. They said I and Mr. Toji were curse users in this world. Meaning, in this place, Gorjo, being the strongest and a sorcerer, had to confront Jito and Toji. Unlike Toji, fighting Jito would have been incredibly difficult for Satoru. It wasn't a matter of strength, but of emotions. Having one strongest versus having two carries a different weight. Although Zoro often deviated, and there were disagreements between Gorjo, Jito, and him, they shared the same heart in not harming innocent people who hadn't caused any harm to them or their loved ones. Above all, Zoro was a friend to Satoru and Suguru. Even though the two were much older, and they had raised their voices in argument, they were undoubtedly friends. It just naturally happened that way. Despite having different intentions and goals, helping a friend was natural for Zoro. Thus, when either of them was in trouble or faltering, they could always ask Zoro for help. This Satoru couldn't do that. He was the strongest, and he was alone. Satoru. Jito called his name. Gorjo looked straight at Jito again. Why did Jito Suguru in this world become a curse user? Gorjo's lips twisted. Because he hated non-sorcerers. Creating a world only for sorcerers and such were secondary reasons. As Jito himself said, it was simply because he couldn't truly smile in a world where non-sorcerers existed. That was the reason the two parted ways, and it was what led Satoru to utter despair. The world Suguru dreamed of was something Satoru couldn't accept. Jito could roughly guess why Jito in this world became a cursed user. He had once pondered similar dilemmas. While he remained a sorcerer and found his own way, this world's Jito did not. Thus, he left the sorcery society and became a cursed user, rejecting non-sorcerers altogether he seems to be dead now. If not, Satoru wouldn't look at him with such eyes. Big or small, Satoru must have been involved in Jito's death. There was no blame in his thoughts. Gorjo had simply fulfilled his duty as a sorcerer. Of course, if it were the Satoru that Jito knew. Duties aside, if Jito had defected, Satoru might have just defected alongside Jito. Might as well take a break. Huh? Let Zoro handle a mission and see how it goes. If he goes on one, who knows, he might get lost and come back a month later. Imagining Satoru laughing heartily at such a scenario, Jito neatly folded and discarded his imagination. The Satoru in this world was far more insane and much more free than the Satoru Jito knew. A little, no, significantly more reckless. But there were many who could manage him. I once wished to see a responsible Satoru, but actually seeing it was somewhat bittersweet. In the world, the burden shared by many was borne alone by Satoru here. Jito spoke sincerely to the Satoru in front of him. You must have had it tough, Satoru. Gorjo paused. His vivid blue eyes that had been roaming Jito's face softened. If you know it's been tough, can't you stay here? Gorjo intended to say it jokingly, but it came out quite stark. Stay by my side. Caring for the weak is exhausting. Raising a strong sorcerer equal to Gorjo is incredibly difficult, endlessly long, and tiresome. Although there are outstanding disciples like Itadori, 
Akatsu, and Hikari, they are still far from being able to share Gojo's burden. If only you had stayed by my side, I would have always been content. Jito shook his head. That would be difficult. I have a Satoru on my side too. If Jito doesn't return, that Satoru might also cross over through a curse. No, he definitely will. Always looking for an excuse to skive off, he gleefully jumped into a curse to come find Jito. Jito needed to return before that happened. Whoosh. Zoro turned his head, followed by Gojo then Toji and Jito, and finally, Nanami. They all looked towards the clearing where they had appeared, feeling the blue energy swirling again. It was time to return. Looks like it's about time to go. Should I untie you? Eh? No, it's fine. Crack. Jito stood up, breaking the chair he was sitting on with his bare hands, without using any energy. Slipping the rope through the cracks, Jito dusted himself off and stood up. Gorjo looked at the broken pieces of the metal chair with a baffled expression to which Jito offered a grin. I do know a bit of hand-to-hand -hand combat. If it were purely physical combat, he'd be almost equal to Satoru. Of course, not as much as Toji. Shosha. Zoro drew his sword and sliced through the rope as if it were butter. Nanami sighed at the coin-sized pieces of rope. He appreciated being freed, but wondered if it was necessary to cut them so finely. Could have reused them if they were cut nicely but expecting that from Zoro is too much. With a resigned heart, Nanami called out to Gorjo. I have something for you, Gorjo. Yeah, what is it, Nanaman? Nanami pulled out a USB, then his brows furrowed deeply. On the USB, marked with to Nanami and unmistakably drawn by Gorjo, was a doodle. Nanami quickly handed over the unsightly USB to Gorjo of this world. Gorjo looked at it and chuckled. What's this? Porn. It contains data on incidents involving grade 1 and above curses and curse users that have occurred in our world over the last three years. Nanami said, neatly ignoring Gorjo's comment. If you come across any curse or curse user incidents reported here that resemble cases in Jujutsu High, please refer to it. It could help reduce casualties. This was prepared by Jujutsu High as soon as they learned Zoro had gone to a parallel world. Due to time constraints, not all deployment records could be included, but having reports from areas where grade 1 and above curses occurred, could prevent significant casualties. Gorjo cheerfully responded, Thanks Nanaman, you're competent over there too. That's unfortunate. Meaning the Nanami of this world was also struggling. Exiting the jail, Toji encountered Fushiguro Megumi, who was waiting outside. Toji signaled Zoro with a glance, and Zoro followed Jito, giving space. Now only Zen and Toji and Fushiguro Megumi were left in the corridor. Toji sized up Megumi. It seemed he had been injured recently or had not long ago healed with an inverse curse technique, but there didn't appear to be any major issues. He seemed weaker than the Megumi from their world, but that was to be expected. Megumi, Fushiguro. Fushiguro responded coldly. The man standing in front of him, to Fushiguro's eyes, was eerily similar to himself. Annoyingly so, Toji was more interested in the surname Fushiguro than Megumi's cold demeanor, not Zenin. It was a relief. Here, there was neither a Zoro nor a Toji to stand against the tyranny of the Zenin clan. Born with the Ten Shadows technique, which was considered the pinnacle among the shadow techniques, he wouldn't be mistreated like Toji had been even if his surname was Zenin, but still, happiness seemed far away in many respects. Toji sincerely, albeit briefly, said, That's good. Is your sister doing well? Fushiguro was taken aback. He hadn't expected him to ask about Tsumiki. No. What? Why? Toji, surprised, asked back, while Fushiguro looked at him with a complex expression. He seemed genuinely concerned about Tsumiki. The father Fushiguro knew wouldn't have done so. It would be fortunate if he even remembered Tsumiki's name. Or, he might not even remember Megumi's name. Fushiguro, lost in thought and standing quietly in front of Toji, was met with Toji's calm invitation. Say whatever you want to say. Whether it was questions, resentments, or anger, Toji was ready to accept them. Because it was Megumi, Fushiguro's expression became complex. There was much he wanted to ask, argue about, and even people he wanted to shake by the collar or sick his divine dogs on. But the time granted to them was too short. So, Fushiguro Megumi asked the question that had lingered in his mind the longest. Your son's names. Why did you name them that way? First off, I didn't name Zoro. It was Chie who named him. When Fushiguro looked puzzled, Toji added, Your mother's name. Hearing about his mother for the first time, Megumi stiffened. Toji quickly realized that Megumi knew absolutely nothing about his own mother. Of course, there's no way I would have told him here. Tanaka Chie, that's your mother's name. She loved you a lot. In my world, she's buried in Eomlaut Eomlaut Cemetery I don't know about here. Maybe he'd visit if there was a chance. Fushiguro seemed shocked by Toji's words, his face going blank. The reason I named you Megumi was because I hoped you wouldn't end up like me. Not having power, not possessing any esteemed techniques that would make the Zenin chase after you. Having a warm mother, supportive siblings, and love that seemed so natural. Born into blessings with everything, Toji hoped that Megumi would enjoy all that he could not, living not as an outcast. 
but in the brightest, most glorious place, surrounded by people he loved, without being marginalized, angry at what he couldn't have, or hating himself. After a long silence, Megumi let out a cough-like laugh. What does becoming like you even mean? You're already quite different from me, so no need to worry. Just the fact that he was actively a sorcerer in the light was evidence enough. He seemed to get along well with his friends earlier. Toji was somewhat concerned that there was no one to stop Gorjo from teasing Megumi. But still, receiving attention was better than being ignored. If Gorjo was protecting him, the Zenin family wouldn't be able to bother Megumi. Be cautious of the Zenin family. If it's about the Ten Shadows technique, they'll stop at nothing to get their way. The energy from the other side surged significantly. It was really time to go. Toji almost unconsciously patted Fushiguro's head, but then smiled wryly and lowered his hand. He didn't have the right to do so. Thank you for growing up well, and I'm sorry for everything. Leaving a shocked Megumi behind, Toji turned and disappeared. Left alone in the hallway, Megumi stood still, mulling over Toji's apology. A vague yet clear apology. Something Megumi had neither expected nor anticipated from his father. Ironically, that realization made Fushiguro understand. That person isn't him. The father Fushiguro Megumi had resented being angry with, disappointed in and perhaps even waited for, a little. Wasn't that person. Caught between the urge to cry and laugh, Megumi stood frozen, not moving an inch. Yo, Fushiguro. Itadori approached from behind, wrapping his arm around Megumi's neck, and examined his face. Are you okay? Yeah. Kujasaki also came over to check on Fushiguro's complexion, then let out a sigh of relief. Good thing. I was worried about how to comfort you if you cried. No need for that. Shouldn't you be heading back to the infirmary? You're a patient after all, Fushiguro. Megumi. Gorjo called out to Fushiguro, bouncing towards them from the end of the hallway. Megumi sighed briefly. Later, there was something he needed to discuss alone with teacher Gorjo. Itadori and Kujasaki nodded and stepped aside. Gorjo, as usual, pulled Fushiguro into his embrace. Fushiguro, accustomed to it, pushed away Gorjo's long arms wrapped around him and asked, Did they leave? Yeah. Whatever that curse was, the energy flow was incredibly stable. They must have safely returned to their original world. It seemed he had made time for a conversation with Megumi just before leaving. Gorjo, his blue eyes shining from behind his sunglasses, asked Megumi. So, Megumi, how do you feel about meeting your father? That person isn't my father. Quite D-E-F-I-N-I-T-I-V-E till the don't you think so too, teacher Gorjo. Hum, it's different indeed. His personality was quite soft. Your father wasn't like that at all. It was funny. The strength itself seemed much greater in the one we met this time than your father. Though, Gorjo murmured. The unyielding arm finally relented. Gorjo looked directly at Megumi and asked, So, Megumi, have you come up with anything you want to ask me? About your father. Peering through the black sunglasses, revealing eyes that seemed to see everything, Megumi quietly shook his head. Later, even if what comes from your lips is what I had imagined, even if it's more than I thought, even if it's different from what I had in mind, no matter what you say, when I can face you without running away, when I can listen till the end, express my anger, and bear my grievances, and perhaps when I can forgive, then I'll ask. Gorjo hummed, examining Megumi, then cracked a smile. All right, then let's go eat. I'm technically still a patient. Ah, hopeless as always. Megumi pressed a hand to his forehead. Days later, after completing a mission, Fushiguro Megumi visited the graveyard Toji had mentioned. Among numerous tombstones, one particularly covered in dust caught his attention, bearing his mother's name. Fushiguro stood there for a long time. Then, he laid down white flowers at the tombstone, just as his brother had done in another world. Time passed, and then some more. And on the night of Halloween, the anomaly returned. October the 30th, 31st, 2018, 9.27pm. Shibaya, blue energy tore through the space, and Zoro tumbled out, landing on the ground. Barely managing to land on his feet, Zoro scratched the back of his head. Damn, not this again. What the hell is going on? Zoro spotted a cubic shaped curse tightly sealed into the ground right in front of him. It contained a massive energy and presence. It was Gorjo Satoru. Narrowing his eyes, Zoro looked up to find Jido Suguru standing before him, a scar stitched across his entire forehead. No, this man isn't Suguru. Zoro recognized those stitched scars. He also felt a strange alien sensation in the brain area. Unconsciously, his teeth gritted. Recognizing his opponent, Zoro's hands swiftly moved to grip the hilt of his sword. A powerful aura and intent to kill burst forth, enveloping the surroundings. Cloaked in thick green and golden aura, Zoro's eyes shimmered with a crimson killing intent as he spoke. You, why are you alive? Zoro and Jito got in the car with the assistant director to carry out their mission. Jito glanced at Zoro sitting next to him. Zoro, are you really okay? I'm fine. Being a sorcerer is no easy task. Even strong and talented people can run away in fear and disgust. Zoro blinked. Disgust. I mean the spirits. They look scary and grotesque. You have to keep facing them. It was news to Zoro. With his observation Haki, he could only sense presences and vague shapes, not seeing the spirits themselves. I knew the shapes I sensed with Haki were a bit peculiar. If Jito was sowing this, 
They must really look grotesque. Anyway, Zoro told the truth. I can't see them. Huh. I don't see the spirits. Really? Yeah. Jito, testing him, pulled out a bright red moth-shaped spirit he had captured. The moth had the character for evil prominently displayed on its red body. What color is this? Guess right, and I'll give you 10,000 yen. Zoro looked directly at where the moth was, but couldn't discern the color and frowned. I don't know. Gray. It's red, and a very vivid red at that. What's the shape? Roughly an insect with wings. Like a big butterfly. He could recognize the shape at least. Jito realized. Well, otherwise it would be hard to fight. What do you think is drawn on the surface of the spirit? Is there something? A blue flower. Is that so? Jito, seeing that Zoro accepted his lie without a hint of doubt, realized that Zoro truly could not see what the spirits looked like. Isn't it inconvenient to fight when you can't see the spirits? Not really. I just need to turn on my observation Haki as needed to sense their presence. It was the same in my previous life. By the way, what exactly are we going to do now? Um, just a moment. Jito rummaged through the documents the assistant director had handed him before they got in the car. First, the location is Gukoku Village in Kii City, Gunma Prefecture. The village had a total population of 108, making it a small village. The estimated grade of the spirit was nearly first class. The phenomena involved with the disappearances of women and the deaths of men. From 1998 to 2000, 2001, 2002, 2005, and 2006 incidents presumed to be vanishings occurred consistently in this village. All incidents occurred within a 50-meter radius of a cave regarded as sacred by the village. Cheeto's expression darkened as he read that among the victims, young women disappeared, and middle-aged women and men were found dead without their heads. To send a six-year-old on such a mission, the cruelty of the incident itself, the entanglement with the folklore of vanishings, and the need to stay in the village for several days to investigate the truth of the matter. It's a task that normally requires an experienced first-class sorcerer. That's why they assigned Jito to it. Confirming that the legend of vanishing was transmitted in the village, Jito asked Zoro. Zoro, do you know what a vanishing is? I don't know. It's an old superstition. Literally, it's like people disappear as if hidden, vanished by a deity. Initially, it probably started as simple disappearances. In old times, guest deaths weren't uncommon, and they would have just buried them without knowing where or how to search. But as such cases increased one by one, and people began to name and fear these as vanishings. The curse is drawn. Or, fear, distrust, resignation, injustice. Such negative emotions from people are indeed the source of the curse. The vanishings that have persisted to modern times have been transmitted that way. An unfortunate accident from the distant past gets tangled and retold by people, becoming a more formidable curse. Especially if it has been passed down as a legend within the community of the village over generations, the curse would have consistently grown stronger. Zoro looked intrigued. So, are we going to kill a god? Sorcerers might put it that way. Mostly, it's just spirits that cause vanishings. It's not that none of the spirits are named deity. But to be that, they would have to be of special class. Cheeto thought of smallpox deity one of the 16 special class spirits. Zoro tilted his head curiously. Nearly first class is that around Mei Mei's rank. Senior Mei is first class. And even at the same rank, spirits are much weaker than sorcerers. Really? Zoro sounded disappointed. If Gorjo had said this, Jito would have advised him to focus on saving rather than fighting. That's the duty of a sorcerer. However, Jito couldn't say the same to Zoro. Zoro was a sorcerer but he was too young to be burdened with such responsibilities. Zoro looked up at the pensive Jito. Don't worry about it. I actually think it took quite a long time to get to this point. Zoro muttered. In his previous life, those with formidable power were eventually forced to choose to become marines, pirates, one of the seven warlords, or revolutionaries when the time came. For Zoro, that time had come once again. My father and Jito seem to think it's too early. But Zoro didn't think it was too early. Even though he hadn't reached the same level of power as his previous life, he was strong enough to stand a fight against the powerful ones in this world, and above all, he was a reincarnate. If you combine my age in my previous life and this one, I'm older than my father. Though it was only by a year or two, it does sound strange to say I'm older than my father. Well, it wasn't the first time something strange had happened in Zoro's life. Zoro shrugged. It was time for him to officially step into the world and decide what to do. Ultimately, the decision about what to do in that world was entirely up to Zoro. I hate being ordered around, except for Luffy's orders. But this time, Zoro had a feeling that he had to go. That's why he had decided to go on the mission despite it being an order from above. I'll know once I get there. Zoro closed his eyes. It was a good idea to rest until they arrived. The incident occurred in Gukoku village, which was so remote that cars couldn't enter. So the assistant director dropped them off about one kilometer away from the village at a crossroads. I'll meet you here in three days at this time. If you haven't completed the mission by then or feel that you cannot resolve the incident, please let me know. Cheeto acknowledged. Then, he made sure Zoro wouldn't lose his way as they entered Gikoku village, as directed by the assistant director. At the entrance of the village, about 10 villagers, including the village chief, were already gathered. They hesitated upon seeing Jito and Zoro, 
then began to murmur among themselves. Are these the people sent to solve the vanishing? Aren't they too young? One of them even looks under 10. They must be taking our village lightly. They probably think it doesn't matter if a few of us are harmed because we're few. The village chief cleared his throat loudly, which quieted the murmuring somewhat. Are you the ones sent to resolve this incident? Yes, we are, but there's a child among you. The village chief asked cautiously, to which Cheeto responded with a smile placing his hand on Zoro's shoulder. He's young, but stronger than anyone else. I believe he will definitely help end the tragic events you're experiencing. But he's still a child. My daughter almost died in that incident. Don't you plan to bring more qualified people? That's right. My grandson was hurt recently because of the curse. They needed to stay in the village for a few days and gather information about the spirits based on the village's statements. But the reaction was not at all welcoming. Now, please calm down. Cheeto was about to try to pacify the villagers with a forced smile. When Zoro wrinkled his nose at a smell he detected, he looked around at the people to locate the source of the smell. Not one or two, but three, four, five, six. There's a smell of blood. What? Zoro closed his eyes and spread his observation haki throughout the village. Then, from beneath the ground, he sensed two particularly faint and weak presences. Underground, Zoro, having opened his eyes, dashed past the villagers standing in front of him. Cheeto, well aware that Zoro should not be left alone, was alarmed. Wait, Zoro. Hey, where are you rushing into? I'm sorry. He's a child that shouldn't be left alone. And that's why I'm asking. Why bring a kid in the first place? Jito didn't wait to hear more and rushed after Zoro, knowing that once Zoro was out of sight, it could be disastrous. Bang. Zoro kicked open the door of the storage room in the house closest to the village entrance. Finding nothing, he kicked open another house's storage room door. Bang. Bang bang. After a few tries, there was a passage leading underground in the floor of one of the storages. Seeing the passage that led deep underground, Zoro twisted his lips. This is it. There was a smell of blood coming from inside. Jito who had quickly followed, stood next to Zoro. Zoro, you can't just rush off like that. There's a smell of blood from below. Really? Could there be a spirit down there? But seeing candles at intervals along the passage suggested it was frequented more by humans than spirits. While Jito was pondering, the village chief, who had run breathlessly to the spot, spoke. Oh, you really are different being the ones sent to resolve this. We have confined the cause of the vanishings down there. The cause. If it was the cause, did that mean a spirit? Had they confined a spirit? Did this village have a sorcerer? The village chief nodded vigorously. Yes, but we're not sure if capturing it has ended the problem or how to deal with it without repercussions. So we sought helps it. Zoro didn't wait to hear the rest and dashed into the passage. After all, Zoro could distinguish between human and spirit presences. He knew there was no spirit down there. As soon as he stepped into the underground space at the end of the straight passage, Zoro could understand the intuition that had made him feel he had to come here. Two girls, younger than Zoro but older than Megumi, appeared to be about the age of Tsumiki, were locked in an underground jail made of wooden bars. The two, seemingly sisters, clung to each other to keep warm or for comfort. Their filthy and emaciated bodies, toes frozen from the cold, bruises of vivid colors all over their bodies, and blood sprinkled on their worn clothes, all spoke of blatant abuse. Zoro clenched his fist tightly. Zoro, please, wait for Jito, coming down the passage with the village chief belatedly, paused mid-sentence, as his eyes fell on the two visibly abused girls. Shito muttered with a hardened face. What is this? And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.